Welcome to Learn Angular from Modern Web Applications Live Lessons. I'm Sean Wassell. I've been working extensively with Angular and JavaScript both professionally and as a hobby for quite a long time. And in that time, I've come to appreciate what a tremendously powerful tool Angular is for building web applications. In this course, I've pulled together everything that I've learned about Angular in the past few years in a way that should make it very straightforward for you to learn both the basic and advanced concepts. I'm really pleased to be your guide and help you learn everything that this popular front-end library has to offer. But before we jump into learning Angular, let's go over the basic structure of the course. The first lesson in this course provides an overview of Angular as a library within the wider context of front-end development. It covers such topics as what can be done with Angular, what it's good at, and we also create and run our first Angular program while learning the basics of Angular syntax. In the second lesson, we move on to learning about the component lifecycle, how to use state in our components, as well as how to handle other events that occur in our web applications. After that, we move on to the third lesson where we talk about routing in Angular, as well as a few related concepts such as URL and query parameters. And we then move on to see how to create several commonly used front-end components in Angular, such as forms and sidebars, as well as how to make network requests from Angular components. After that, we move on to see how to write so-called clean Angular code. We take a look at a few very important patterns and anti-patterns in Angular and how to make sure your web applications remain performant and maintainable for the foreseeable future. We then move on to a few advanced Angular concepts, such as view encapsulation, adding pre-made style libraries, and something called the ng content directive. And finally, last but not least, we're going to look at how to actually build and host the Angular applications that we've created, which is a very often overlooked topic. Well, that's the basic plan for this course. Thanks again for joining me in this live lessons, and I hope you enjoy learning Angular. Welcome to lesson one, learn basic Angular syntax and concepts. In this lesson, you learn some of the basics of Angular by writing and running your first Angular application. By the end of the lesson, you'll have an in-depth background knowledge of the basics, which will provide a great foundation for you as you move on to more complicated topics later on in the course. So we start off by looking at some of the background and wider context surrounding the purpose and benefits of Angular. And from there, we're going to see how to create and run a basic Angular app. We learn how to use Angular components to define user interfaces. We create our own Angular components and we learn about component inputs and how to use them. We'll then see how to render components conditionally in Angular and other very important tasks such as displaying lists and adding styles to Angular components. Then we move on to look at how to handle events such as clicks and then learn about a concept called outputs in Angular. Besides the basic syntax which we learned in an earlier lesson, the concepts that we cover here are some of the most important concepts for any newcomer to Angular to learn. So let's get started. So you're watching a course about Angular, and I'm going to assume that that's at least partly because you've heard about the large number of companies that have adopted this technology to build their websites. And of course, this means that there are a lot of Angular-related job postings that have opened up as a result as well. Now, I'm not going to be too surprised if this is your main motivation for learning Angular, but before we actually get to the learning, it's just as important, I think, to understand the purpose and benefits of Angular that have led to this adoption in the first place. So in other words, what is it about Angular that makes it worth the trouble for companies to invest their time and money into converting their websites over to Angular from whatever technology they were previously using, such as, you know, JSP, .NET, vanilla JavaScript, uh, maybe just a static site. And perhaps even more relevant than that question is, how does Angular compare to other libraries like React? So in order to answer this question, let's start off by taking a look at exactly what Angular is. Angular is an open source front-end framework that was originally created by Google, and it still continues to be maintained by Google as well as the open source community as a whole. 
And Angular was created to help developers quickly create these maintainable performant applications. And we're gonna see throughout this course that it provides a very nice structure for organizing all of the nitty gritty details associated with front end development. And in addition to that, Angular also allows developers to create modular components that can be used throughout our applications, and this can drastically reduce the amount of code that we end up writing, since we're allowed to create one piece of our website, and then if we need to use it in various places throughout our website, we're able to just reuse that same component. We'll take a look at how exactly that's done later on in the course. So among some of the other benefits of Angular is the fact that it's written in TypeScript. So TypeScript, as many of you know, is a dialect of JavaScript. It's basically JavaScript with static typing added on top of it. And many JavaScript developers have found that TypeScript really helps keep code organized and maintainable at an enterprise scale. All right, so in other words, as your applications get larger and larger, having those static types can really help you make sure that your code keeps consistent quality. So moving on, another benefit of Angular is that it's been around for a little while. Angular has been around since about 2010, although it has undergone some pretty major changes since then. Angular as we know it now, however, has been around since about 2015. And while this obviously might not sound like that long ago to anyone who's used to working with languages like C++ and the like, it's an eternity in terms of web development libraries. And this means that Angular is one of those things where you can Google pretty much any error you're getting or anything you want to know, and you'll find a lot of useful posts. You'll find a lot of people who have asked those same questions in forums and so on. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about in this video, which is the big question that I get asked almost every time that I talk about Angular or React or Vue is how do these libraries compare to each other, right? How does Angular in particular compare to other libraries such as React and Vue? The main problem that all of these platforms are trying to solve is how can we make web development as easy and maintainable and performant as possible? Okay, and right, obviously all of them go about it in different ways, as we'll see in this course. But the one thing I want to talk about with Angular, the main difference between Angular and React is that Angular is much more opinionated, right? Angular is what we call a framework, whereas React we refer to more as a library. And what that means is that Angular provides a lot more structure, right? There's a right way to do everything, so to speak. Whereas in React, there are many different ways to do almost everything, which can cause difficulties for people a lot of the time, right? And as far as views concerned, the goal of Vue was to create a framework that would be very easy to add to existing web applications, right? And that's a big difference between Angular and Vue is that Vue would be much easier to transfer over gradually if you wanted to switch a website over gradually from some other technology. Whereas Angular, it's much easier if you just start your website from scratch in Angular and rewrite the whole thing there. So those are the basic differences between Angular and React and Vue, right? Angular is really focused on providing a lot of structure for developers. React gives you the flexibility to basically create your own system of organization on your website, which a lot of people find they like. And Vue, the main benefit of Vue is that it's easy to add to existing websites without rewriting the whole thing. So those are the basic differences between those three. With all that said, let's get started and see what it's like to actually work with Angular and how to use it to build web applications. So now that we know a little bit more about the purpose and background of Angular, let's jump right into creating and running our first Angular app. So what we usually do to create a new Angular app is to use Angular's so-called boilerplate generator or CLI tools. And basically the Angular CLI just provides scripts that we can run to automatically generate all of the Angular boilerplate code for us. Now a question that comes up quite a bit is, is it possible to create an Angular project without using a boilerplate generator? And the answer to that is that yes, it would be possible, but I definitely wouldn't recommend it, right? There's just a lot of boilerplate code involved in Angular where setting it up all on your own without the CLI is just not really, there's not really any point to doing it that way. So we're gonna see how to set up our own Angular project, but before you do that, 
you're going to want to head over to nodejs.org and make sure that you have the latest version of Node.js installed. Okay, and if you don't, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to download the LTS version, that's long-term service, and just make sure everything is set up locally. Otherwise, a lot of the code that we try and run here probably won't work very well. So once you've done that, open up your favorite IDE. My IDE of choice for Angular development is Visual Studio Code, which has this nice integrated terminal as well. So open up an IDE, and just to make sure that you have the latest version of Node installed, you're gonna to wanna to run the command Node-V. And if you have something that's slightly behind the version that I just showed over here, that's all right too. Uh, but you just don't wanna have version eight or something like that, right? You don't wanna have a very old version. And with that, you're gonna to wanna to check your NPM version as well, make sure it's close to that, because these are the ones that I'm gonna be using. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's actually create our first Angular project. The way we're gonna do this is in our terminal, we're gonna to navigate to the directory that we want our new Angular directory for our app to be in. All right, so for me, that's gonna be inside repos. And once we're there, we're gonna type the command npm install dash g, and we're gonna install the Angular CLI, which is gonna be at Angular slash CLI. And we're gonna hit enter. And that'll spin for a little while while it installs the Angular command line interface tools for us. And depending on your settings, it may or may not ask you if you want to share anonymous usage data with the Angular team. Uh, sure, why not? You can choose no if you want to. And now we have the Angular tools installed. Okay, so in order to make sure that everything installed correctly, just type the command ng dash dash version, and it should print out something to the console that looks more or less like this, all right? Okay, so our Angular CLI is working correctly. Let's use it to generate a new Angular project for us. The way we're gonna do this, pretty straightforward. We just type the command ng new, and then whatever we wanna call this app, I'm gonna call it my Angular app, hit enter. And it's gonna ask us a series of questions here. So first of all, it's gonna ask if we wanna enforce stricter type checking and bundle budgets in the workspace. Sure, we'll do that. Would you like to add Angular routing? We're gonna say yes to this since I'm gonna show you how to do routing in Angular a little later on in the course. Although it is possible to add it later, even if you say no right now. Next thing, it's gonna ask us which style sheet format we wanna use. We can see that it gives us several options such as CSS, SCSS, SAS, LESS, Stylus, etc. I'm gonna stick with CSS for now. And that might run for a little while, but once it finishes, we'll have our new Angular app all generated. So in order to open this in your editor, you're gonna to want to do CD into whatever folder you just created. Mine again is called my Angular app. And then if you're using Visual Studio Code, you can just open that by typing code with a dot after it, and it'll open up a Visual Studio Code window with our Angular app directory. So we can see here that there's quite a few files that Angular generated for us, and even more so if we open up source and app and assets, environments, all those things. And that's why I say that it's not necessarily the best idea to try and set up an Angular app for yourself, even if it is theoretically possible. All right, there's just a lot of boilerplate here that Angular takes care of for us just by running the CLI. Now we're gonna discuss what all of these files are shortly, but first I wanna show you how to actually run an Angular app. So let's open up a terminal again inside our my Angular app directory. And the way we run our Angular app now is using the Angular CLI again. And we're gonna run the command ng serve and it might ask you that question again. And when we run that command, it's gonna take a little while while it does the initial build, right? So what it's doing right now is it's building all of our Angular code into scripts that can be run inside a browser. Okay, and once you see that it says compiled successfully, you'll be able to open up your browser to localhost 4200 and see the results. So I'm just gonna click on this and open it in my browser. 
And here we see our boilerplate application that Angular generates for us. All right, so this is currently running on localhost. In a minute, I'll show you where all this content is actually coming from. It's just inside one of our Angular project files. So we'll be deleting most of it and starting fresh with our own project. Okay, so now that we've generated and run our Angular app, the next thing I wanna do, and you can stop your Angular app by typing control C too, by the way. But the next thing I wanna do is take a look at the actual files in our Angular directories here. Okay, so first, just to give you a high level overview of everything, when we're editing an Angular app, most of the time we're gonna spend in development is gonna be inside this source app folder. All right, so we'll take a closer look at this shortly, but this is where basically all of the components we create are gonna end up. But anyway, on the root level of our directory, we're gonna have our end-to-end -end testing directory. This is just gonna contain the setup logic and our end-to-end -end tests, which are written using Protractor. That's just Angular's end-to-end -end testing framework of choice. We have our node modules, obviously. We have our source directory, which I'll go into more detail on in a second. And other than that, most of the other things out here are just configuration files, right? So configuration for testing, configuration for, you know, we have our package JSON, package lock JSON, our TypeScript configuration files, our lint configuration, all those kind of things, right? So it's all just configuration files out here. Let's go into our source directory, all right? So we have our app directory, which contains all of our component code, as I said. And I also mentioned that this is where we're gonna be spending most of our time in this course. We'll go into more detail in just a second here. We have our assets directory, which contains any special assets our project needs, such as images. Right, there's nothing in here right now. There's right, there's just a git keep file so that git will pay attention to this directory. We have our environments directory, which contains files for specifying different environment variables. All right, and other than that, we have our index.html file. This is where the Angular app actually gets rendered into. Okay, and more specifically, the Angular app that we create using our components inside this app directory is going to be rendered right here where we see this app root element, okay? That's just kind of what happens when the browser receives the HTML document, it looks for the app root element, runs some scripts and renders our Angular app inside of that, okay? So other than that, we have our main.ts file. This is the sort of code entry point for our application. This bootstrap module function that we call here is what actually kicks off the rendering process for an Angular app. We generally won't be doing too much editing on any of these files out here, but I just wanted to show them so that you know what they are. We also have polyfills.ts, which uh, basically contains any special packages you need to import for browser compatibility. Uh, I usually use this to import packages that will make things work on older versions of Internet Explorer. That's generally what this polyfills file is for these days. And then we have our styles.css, which contains any global styling for our project. We have our test.ts file, which launches all the tests for our application. And that is about it. So pretty straightforward. Let's take a closer look at what's inside our app directory, since this is where really the exciting stuff is. The first thing I wanna look at is our app.component.ts file, app.component.html file, and our app.component.css files. All right. So we'll talk about this again in a lot more detail shortly, but basically every component in Angular consists of three different files. All right. We have the TypeScript file, which contains the logic that goes on behind the scenes of our component. We have the HTML file, which contains the actual DOM structure of our component, right? This is where we'll define what it looks like uh, when it's actually rendered in the browser. And we have, of course, the CSS file, which in this one is empty, that contains all of the component-specific styling for our component. Okay, so those are the three main parts of any component, and we'll be working with these quite a bit throughout this course, as you'll see. There is another file, which is app.component.spec.ts, and this contains the tests for our component. We're not gonna be discussing testing in Angular in very much detail in this course, because that's honestly a topic that could be a course in itself. But anyway, this is where the tests for Angular components are contained, is in this spec file. 
So these four files have to do with our app component. And our app component, again, is the component that contains all the other components in our Angular applications. The other two files that we have here are our app routing module.ts file. And all this file does is it contains the routing logic for our app. Right, so when we talk about routing later on in the course, this is where we'll actually define the different routes for our application, define the different pages, etc. Okay, and besides that, the only other one inside of here is the app.module.ts file. So what this file is, is when we want to import a module into our Angular application, right? Angular has a lot of sort of plugins, as we'll see, that we can use in our Angular applications. And when we wanna use one of those, we have to come to this file and add it to our project. We'll see how this works when we do things like add network requests to our front end, that kind of stuff. And that's about it. Hopefully that whirlwind tour kind of helped orient you to how everything is organized in an Angular project. All right, so now that we've seen the basic directory structure of an Angular project, let's move on to creating the first component for our application. Now I've mentioned this several times already, but components are the basic units of organization in our Angular projects. What components are, are modular pieces of the interface that we can define and display inside other components. And in this way, we can kind of assemble our user interfaces very easily. So this app component that we just looked at previously is the component in Angular, again, that contains the rest of the components we create. It's sort of the, the root level component, if you will. So what we're gonna do here to get our first experience with creating and using components is we're gonna use the Angular CLI to generate components. So generally, when we wanna create new components in Angular, we're not gonna create them by actually creating the files and adding the code manually. We're gonna use the Angular CLI to generate them. It just makes it a lot easier for us. The way that we generate components in an Angular application is by running the command ng generate component and then whatever we want the name of the component to be. So in our case, let's just call this component example, all right? And you're not gonna want to include the word component in the name of your component because Angular will actually automatically add that in all of the code, as you'll see. All right, so we're gonna generate a component called example. We're gonna hit enter. And that'll generate four new files for us inside its own folder, okay? So we see these are the four different files for our example component. And just as a side note here, if you find yourself generating a lot of different Angular components, there is a shortcut. You can actually just run ng G, C, and then the name of the component as well, right? Some people prefer to use that shortcut all the time. Whatever your preference, it doesn't matter. So if we open up our example component HTML file, we'll see that it just has this little paragraph tag saying example works. All right, and obviously our components are gonna get much more complex than this, but this is just kind of to test that the component actually shows up in the browser. So we'll come back and edit this shortly, but let's also take a look at the components TypeScript file. The first thing you might notice about the components in the TypeScript file is that they have this component decorator thing here. And what this does is it contains basic metadata about our Angular components. So don't let the syntax here throw you off. Um, inside this decorator, we see that we have this selector property, which is app example. And this is the tag, right? This string here is the tag that we're gonna use to insert our example component or whatever component we happen to be working with into the HTML of another component, okay? So to show you what I mean by that, let's open up our app.component.html file. And the first thing we're gonna do here is remove all of the sample code that they gave us, which is just what we saw when we first ran our project. We're gonna delete everything except for this router outlet thing at the bottom, all right? So everything else in this file, all the boilerplate code they gave us for the app component, we're gonna delete and our app component will now just look more like this. We'll talk about what exactly this router outlet thing is a little later in the course, but for now, in order to insert our example component into our app component, in order to make our example component actually be displayed, what we're gonna do, all we need to do is this string here that our component has is its selector. We just have to put that in the HTML like this. So we're just gonna say app example, 
just like that. And just as a side note, Angular by default will give all of our components the prefix app just to make sure they don't conflict with any existing tags in HTML. So now if we run our application again, let's open up our terminal and type ng serve, and you can type dash O as well, which will automatically open that in your browser for you. Kind of a useful thing. And we're gonna see that it'll build again and open it in a browser. And we'll see that it opens it in our browser. And all we'll see now is the example works message from our example component. So let's just make some changes here to show what happens if we change this. All right, if we do something goofy like that, and go back, we'll see that it automatically updates, which is a very nice thing. It does what's called hot reloading, which basically means that as we edit the code and save, it will automatically update what we're seeing locally in our browser. And this isn't super exciting, but it does show us how to display one component inside another component, which is a very, very important thing to know how to do in Angular, since it's how we build most of our apps. Okay, so hopefully you're getting a better idea of how components work as we're going along. We just saw how to display one component inside another component, which obviously is very important. The next component related thing we're gonna look at here is something called inputs. And this is where the real advantage of reusable components really starts to become more apparent. You see, in regular HTML, we're able to pass attributes to different elements to change something about them. So for text input elements, right, which would look something like this, we're able to pass things like placeholder attributes, which would look like this, right? Type your name here. For image tags, we're able to pass source, which will display, you know, whatever image we want to display, something like that. So in a rephrase, so in regular HTML, we're able to pass these attributes to change things about the elements that they apply to. Now, Angular sort of takes this idea and runs with it. Angular components, Right, if we look at our app components HTML, where we're displaying our example component, we can make our components take inputs, which are basically attributes that we ourselves define that change something about our components. So if we went into our example components HTML and we changed this to say something like hello, here, and I'm gonna just delete these other elements. That was just for demonstration. So if we made this say hello, and then we wanted to make this display someone's name, and we wanted to be able to pass that into our example component from another component, that would look something like this, right? We could say name equals Sean or something like that, right? So this is basically what inputs look like, and I'll show you exactly how to make them work in just a minute here. So in order to make components work, there are a few things we have to do. The first thing is that we have to open up this component's TypeScript file, right, which is right here. And we have to import something called input up at the top from the Angular core package. Okay, this is what we use to basically define inputs inside our component, define what kind of inputs it's gonna take. So the way we use this input thing is like this. So if we wanted to define a name input like we have here, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say at input with parentheses after it, and we're gonna say name. Whatever we call this input, it has to match whatever we want to pass in here. And let's say that this is gonna be a string. And we can give it a default value as well, and our default value here will just be an empty string. So now that we have this input, how do we actually display it in our component? Well, the way we do that is we just open up our component's HTML file, and wherever we want to insert the value of an input or some other member variable of our component, the way we do that is by using double curly braces along with the variable name, right? So here we could say hello, and then in double curly braces, name. And what this will do is it'll display the value of whatever this name input ends up being, which we can define, which we can define by passing it into our component like this. It looks almost exactly like we're used to seeing with regular HTML attributes, at least when working with string. I'll show you what it looks like when we work with other data types shortly. So if we go back over and take a look at our app now, we'll see that it says, hello, Sean. And if we change this name to something else, 
something like that, we'll see that that changes. And the interesting thing about this too, this is where the power of components really comes in, is that we can display the same component twice and pass in different values for the input, right? So if we wanted to pass, rephrase, so if we wanted to use our example component with a different name, like that, it would display that same component twice with different data. Okay, so now that we've seen how to create our own components and pass inputs into those components, the next thing we're gonna take a look at is the problem of displaying components conditionally. Okay, so in general, when we're creating interfaces using Angular, there's gonna be a lot of cases, and I do mean a lot, where we need to hide certain parts of the interface or show certain parts of the interface depending on certain criteria. So for example, we might wanna hide one or two inputs if the user hasn't entered a value into another input. We might wanna hide certain pieces of the interface if the user isn't logged in, that kind of thing. There's a lot of different situations where we're gonna to want to hide certain elements depending on just certain criteria or logic inside our program. And the way we do that in Angular is using something called structural directives. So the name might sound a little scary, but all structural directives are, are sort of a special input or attribute that we can attach to pieces of our interface that will change the actual structure of our components, right? The DOM structure of our components, depending on, you know, again, logic behind the scenes. So what do I mean by that? So if we go back to our example component now, let's say that there's a few other pieces of data on this page. So first of all, maybe let's change this to a header. Okay, let's say maybe we want to display the person's age and we'll add inputs for these in just a second as well. So we'll display the person's age. Maybe we'll display their hair color as well. Okay, so first of all, let's actually go and pass these inputs in. So let's say name, age, and we're just gonna pass the age as a string for now. I'll show you how we can pass things like numbers in a minute. And let's pass the hair color, which is also gonna be a string. And let's change this back to, let's change it to a name like Bob. Okay, and for this other one, we'll change it to Brenda. Okay, so we have two example components that we're displaying and we just need to go in here and add the inputs for those. So for the input for age, we'll have that be a string as well. Again, I'll show you how to change that to a number shortly. And we'll have hair color. All right. And now if we go back here and take a look at this, we'll see that this top example component that we passed the age and hair color into are displaying those, and this one on the bottom that we didn't pass those into isn't displaying anything. So where am I going with this? Well, let's say that we wanted our example component to hide certain pieces of the interface if we didn't actually pass in an input for those, right? So in other words, if we didn't pass in an age or hair color for a person, it would hide those respective pieces of the interface. That would be, again, where we use structural directives. So the structural directive that we're gonna look at in this case for showing and hiding certain pieces of the interface is called ng-if. And here's what it looks like. We're gonna say ng-if, and we're gonna say equals, and in quotation marks, we're gonna put the condition that we wanna check for. And if that condition is true, then Angular will show this piece of the interface. If it's not, it will hide it. So in our case, what we wanna know is if age exists, right? If the user passed in an age. So if we passed in an age to this component, it'll display this part. If not, then it will hide this paragraph tag. All right, and the same thing for hair color we're gonna do. We're gonna say ng if equals hair color. And now, if we go back over to our interface, we see that Angular has hidden those pieces of the interface. And just to prove that to you, if we go back here and add Let's say we add just hair color to this. We'll say hair color equals blonde. We'll see that that element now shows up in the interface. 
Okay, so that's a very useful thing to be able to do in interfaces. Now, there are a few variations of ng-if, and one of those variations is if we wanted to show two different variations depending on some kind of condition. So let's say if the user passed in a name, we would display hello with their name, but if they didn't pass in a name, it would just display hello, all right? Right now, if we don't pass in a name, let's go over to our component here and remove the name. What it'll do is it'll display this, it'll have a little space after it, and then it'll have the exclamation point. If we wanted to be able to make it look perfect, you know, remove this space, if the user didn't pass in a name, what we could do is we could go back here and use a somewhat different variation of ng-if. Here's what it's gonna look like. I'm just gonna type it out and then I'll explain it when I'm done. So we're gonna say ng-if name, and then we're gonna say else, we'll say, no name block, all right? So what does no name block mean? Well, no name block is referring to something in Angular called a template. And here's what that's gonna look like. Basically, a template defines a section of the interface that we can refer to by name, all right? So in our case, this template is gonna refer to the block of the interface that we want to display only if the user hasn't passed in a name. So here's what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say, ng template, and then we're gonna put a number sign or a hash mark, and we're gonna say no name block. And this defines the name of this template section here. And then inside there is where we can put something else, right? So if we just wanted to say hello, that's what that would look like. So the way this works now is if we say ng if name else no name block, that means that if name exists, it'll display this element. Otherwise, it'll display the contents of, of our no name block template here. And another thing to note here is that ng element doesn't actually add any other elements to the DOM, right? This is just a way for us to designate certain pieces of our interface that we want to work with like we're doing here. So if we go back now, we'll see that if we don't pass in a name, it's displaying the no name block version. If we go back, and add a name like that. We'll just add that back. We'll see that it displays the other version. And if you wanna see that they really are different, let's just put something completely different in here. All right. And we'll delete that. And we'll see that now it displays the no name blocks contents instead of the other contents. And let's go in and change that back. Okay, so previously we saw how to use the ng-if structural directive in order to either hide or show things on the screen depending on some sort of logic inside our components. And the next thing we're gonna look at is another structural directive in Angular that comes in handy whenever we wanna display a list of elements on the screen. So in order to do this, the first thing we're gonna do is actually generate another component. Okay, we have our example component here. Let's uh, generate another component. And remember to do that, we run ng generate component. You can just abbreviate that GC and then the name of the component. So for our component here, We'll call this people list, all right? And we're going to hit enter, and that will generate a new component for us called people list. Okay, so let's close these ones up here and take a look at the files that it's generated for us. So we're gonna open up the HTML, which again, just contains some very basic HTML that just tells us the component works if we're trying to display it inside another component. We have the TypeScript file, which contains the logic for the component, nothing special here. And we also have the CSS for the component. We're not really gonna make any changes here, so I'll just leave it the way it is. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do here before we see how to use Angular's structural directive for displaying lists is we actually have to define for ourselves a list of data, all right? So what we're gonna do is inside our people list component, we're gonna define an array called people. And this array is just gonna contain some basic data for a few different people that we're gonna display on the screen. You'll see how this works in just a minute. So we're gonna have, say, the person's name, 
we'll say John will have their age as well. And we'll also have their hair color, why not? All right, and let's define a few more people here. We'll have name Jane, age 56, hair color blonde. And let's just do one more. We'll say Bob, age, we'll say 41, hair color red. Okay, so we have our list of people here now. So the next thing we're gonna actually do is display these people to the screen. Now, without using the structural directive that I'm about to show you, there's not really a good way to take elements in an array like we have here and create new elements of the DOM for each of those array elements, right? There's just not really a good way to do that currently. Well, the way we can do that is again using another structural directive. So let's just delete this. And the structural directive I'm gonna show you is gonna be called ng4, okay? So the ng4 structural directive is gonna work like this. All right, we're simply gonna say let person of people, all right? And what it's gonna do is it's gonna duplicate this entire DOM structure, including the element on which we've put this ng4 directive. And for each of those separate iterations of that same portion of the DOM, the person that we're defining here is gonna be a different element in the people array, which again, we're getting from our people list component here. Okay, so, okay, so in one iteration, it's gonna be our first person, and the second one is gonna be this one, and the third one is gonna be this one, so on and so forth. The way we actually use those now, let's say that we want to display their name in like, I don't know, an H3 heading. So we'll just say person.name. That's how we use that right there. We can have their age. We'll just say age and then person.age. And we'll do the same thing with hair color here. Hair color, person dot hair color. Okay, and that is all we really need to do. So let's go back to our app component and display our people list component here. Okay, so let's open up app.component.html. And instead of putting our app example component here, we're just gonna delete that and put our people list component in its place. So we're just gonna say app people list. And if you're wondering how I got that tag, it's from the selector that Angular automatically generates for us on our new component. Okay, so if your app isn't running, you should start it again, again by running ng start or ngs, which again is an abbreviation for those of you who are allergic to typing. And that's gonna build our app and we'll be able to see it in our browser. And oops, it looks like I deleted part of the router outlet tag. So let me add that back. And there we go. So now if we take a look at our app, we'll see that it's displaying all of the data for each of our people. It's duplicating that same DOM structure over and over again using the ng4 structural directive. Okay, so let's take a look at a few more things you can do with that structural directive we just saw. And one last thing that I wanna talk about here is that in order to use the ng4 and the ngif directives together, we actually have to nest them in different elements. All right, so in other words, we can't just put ngif on here along with ng4. Angular doesn't like us to do that. So what we have to do, if we wanted to do something for example, like hide the list under certain circumstances, we'd have to actually have a separate div wrapping this other one. And that's where we'd put the ng if directive, right? So if for example, in our people list component, we had a show list Boolean member variable here. That was default to true. And then we went back to here and said ng if show list. And then we put this other one inside of there. 
If we go back here, we'll see that it shows it, but if we were to now flip that to false, we'll see that it'll hide our list. So that's just one little quirk about combining, rephrase. Okay, so that's just one little quirk about combining directives like this. All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about in our introductory Angular lesson here is styling in Angular components. Okay, so styles in Angular are pretty straightforward and there are two main ways to do them. In order to see the first way, let's just open up the TypeScript file of one of our components, the multiple choice one will do. And you're gonna see that already Angular has generated this CSS thing for us, right? This style URLs property in the component decorator. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to define component-specific styling. All right, so if we go into component.css and add some styles in here, all right, so maybe we want all our buttons to look a little differently. Maybe we want them to have some padding. I want them to have a background color. Make them blue. We'll make the text color white. I'm just adding some very basic styling. It's not gonna look very good. And the last thing, let's just add a border radius. All right, so we'll do something like eight picks. And you're gonna see that right away, our buttons look different based on the styles that we've defined here. Okay, and the thing about these styles in here are that they're component specific. So if we were to remove these styles from here, right, we'll see that the styling goes back to normal. And if we were to put these in the app components CSS file and save it, we would see that those styles would not show up on our multiple choice component, even though our multiple choice component is inside our app component. And that's what I mean by component specific styling is that they'll only apply to the DOM that's managed by the individual component that our CSS file belongs to. All right, so let's put these back in our multiple choice component here. Now, if you do want to add files that will apply to all of the components in our app, the place to do that is in styles.css here. All right, so all right, so if we wanted to make all the buttons in our app that same styling, that's where you'd put them is inside styles.css. This is the global styling file. All right, and actually let's just get rid of that there because we don't actually want all our buttons to be bright blue. All right, so that's the main way to do styling on our Angular components, right? Nine times out of 10, that's the way we're gonna want it to be. The other way to do it is to simply define our styles as a string inside this component decorator. So for example, instead of style URLs here, what we might do is use another property just called styles. And what that looks like is we just have a string that says something like button, background color, blue, all right? So we literally just define our styles as a string and pass them into our component like this, all right? And we'll see that that'll make all our buttons blue. Now, generally, you know, just for purposes of readability, for the sake of being able to manage styles more effectively, we almost always use the style URLs thing here and have our styles in a separate file. So we're gonna uncomment this line here, and there we go. And one last thing that I wanna point out about this style URLs property as well. And before we move on, one last thing I wanna point out about this style URLs thing as well is that we can actually pass multiple file paths to it. So if we want styles from several different CSS files to be sort of combined in our component. So what that's gonna look like is if we define a new file called something like other styles.css and we put some other kind of styling in there, Right? Maybe we want our buttons to have uh, red text. And then inside here, in addition to our multiple choice components CSS file, we also put other styles.css. We're gonna see that those styles will also be applied, obviously in the order that we pass them to our component. All right, and this can actually be pretty useful. All right, and this can sometimes be pretty useful if there's some kind of very specific styling that we only want to apply to a handful of components, 
right? Where, you know, we don't want to put those styles in the global styles, but we also don't want to have to define those same styles on each and every component either. So that's the situation where we use other style URLs. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna take a look at is the topic of event handling in Angular. Okay, so when the user interacts with a page, when they click on a button, when they change a text input, something like that, we're gonna want our components to be able to handle that appropriately and make some sort of change usually. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna do in order to demonstrate how this works in Angular is generate a new component. So let's open up a new terminal window here. And we're gonna do ng generate component. And we'll call this one something like event handling, something like that, event handling, sure. And that's gonna generate our new component files for us. So let's open up the TypeScript and HTML files for that. So we've got our event handling component.html, event handling component.ts. And in order to show you how this works, let's just add a button to our HTML here. We'll say something like button, and we'll just have our button say, click me, right? So with event handling in Angular, what we generally want to do is have some way to have a user clicking on uh, some kind of button on the page trigger one of the methods of the component that the HTML file belongs to. So for example, if we had a method in our event handling component called, I don't know, do something, right? And maybe that just displays an alert. and we want to have this method be called when the user clicks on this button. The way that we do that, right, in the normal HTML way of doing that looks like this, right? We would just say on click and then we would just, you know, do something like, like that, right? However, Angular has its own special syntax for this. And here's what it looks like. We have in parentheses, click, right? That's the name of the event that we're listening for. And then in the quotation marks here, we have a call to whatever function in the component we want to happen, right? So in other words, what this is saying is that when this button is clicked, we want to call the do something method that we've defined in the TypeScript file. Okay. And it's really as simple as that, right? The only weird thing is just this syntax here. So if we open up our app component here and display our event handling component inside of it, we're just gonna remove the people list and put in app event handling like that. And then we're gonna see this big button show up and if we click on it, we're gonna see that it will display an alert with the text hello, just like we wanted. Okay, and obviously you can have multiple methods inside your components TypeScript file that are all called by different buttons, right? So if we wanted to create another button here and have it call a different method, maybe do something else, right? And then we would define a do something else method inside of here. And maybe we'll just have a display an alert that says goodbye, okay? In that case, we're gonna see that if we click on one of these buttons, it calls the corresponding method inside the component. Now you might also be wondering if there's a way that we can pass arguments to these functions that we're calling, right? If we wanted to pass in, let's say a string of some kind. And the answer to that again is yes, what we can do is we can just pass in a string here, something like that. And if we were to change our do something method here, To look like this, right? Maybe it takes a message as an argument. And then we would say something like the button says, and then we print the message. Okay, so in that case, if we click on the button now, we're gonna see now the button says hello, right? That's the argument that the button is passing in. And this can happen also with member variables of the component. All right, so if we had inside our component here, something like message equals I'm a component, something like that. What we could do instead of just passing a hard-coded string inside of here is actually pass the value of the message variable from our component. That's what this would do here. 
Okay, so if we go back here and click on our button, we'll see the alert says now, the button says I'm a component, okay? And those are the essentials behind basic event handling in Angular. Okay, so we've seen the essentials of event handling in Angular, but one interesting thing is that Angular actually takes this idea of, you know, buttons triggering events, text inputs triggering events, that kind of thing, and extends it to allow all components to trigger events that we basically get to define. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's define a new component here. I've just been defining a new component for every new concept that we learn, as you can see. And we'll call this component something like uh, multiple choice. All right. And you'll see what this is going to do. Basically, this component is just going to consist of a few different buttons. And whenever we click on one of them, it's going to trigger a different event that the parent component can then tap into. That might not make a whole lot of sense just yet, so, so don't worry too much about it. I'll walk you through how it works. It's the first thing that we want to do now is we're going to open up our multiple choice components, HTML, and TypeScript files. All right. And our HTML is just going to look something like this. We're just going to have a basic div. And we're going to have four different buttons, each of which is going to have a different letter on it. All right, so A, B, C, D. Let's go through and change those. Okay, and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to define a different method for each of the buttons to call. So what we're going to do is we're going to define one called A clicked. We'll have one called B clicked. And we'll have one C clicked and D clicked as well. Okay, and each of these buttons, what they're going to do is just call that respective method. All right, so the A button we'll call A clicked, the B button we'll call B clicked, and so on and so forth. All right, so let's change those to their respective letters. Oops, and we need to add parentheses after each of these as well. Just like that. And there we go. Okay, so I'm not actually going to show you that these works. You should just know that when we looked at click handling previously. But what we're going to do is we're going to allow other components to use our multiple choice component in the following way. I'm going to type it just inside the HTML of our multiple choice component here, but this is just for demonstration purposes. We're going to be doing this inside another component, probably the app component. So what it's going to look like when people use our multiple choice component will be something like this. They're going to do app multiple choice. And just like we're able to tap into a click event that a button triggers by putting the word click in parentheses and doing something like this, other components are going to be able to use our multiple choice component by wrapping some other event name that we get to define in parentheses. So if we wanted to have an event called answer selected or something like that, because that would then call some method on whatever component is using our multiple choice component, that's more or less what that would look like, right? We would just have answer selected in parentheses. And what we're going to do, just to make this very easy, is we're actually just going to have four different events. One called A. Okay, so this will be whatever the parent component does on A. All right, something like that. And then we'll have B. We'll have C. And we'll have D. Okay. Just like that. So in order to make this happen, there are a few things we have to do. The first thing we have to do, up at the top of our multiple choice component, we're gonna import a few things. All right, so from our Angular core package, in addition to component and on init, we're gonna import output, and we're gonna also import something called event emitter. All right, we need these two things in order to define our own events on the components we create. Okay, so having our component trigger events is going to look like this. What we need to do is up at the top here, just like 
as you've seen, we've defined inputs. We're going to define an output for our component. Okay, so that's going to look like this. We're going to say output with parentheses after it. And then we'll say A. And we're going to set this equal to a new event emitter. Okay, with the type void. And I'll show you why we do this in just a second, right? But basically an event emitter is just something that we can call in order to trigger whatever the parent component wants to do with that event, okay? I'll show you what that looks like again in a minute or two. So let's create more outputs. We wanted one for all four of our buttons. We're gonna say B, C, and D, just like that. And then what we're gonna do, the way that we actually trigger this A event or B event or C event or D event is gonna be like this. We're just gonna say inside our A clicked method here, we're just gonna say this, dot a, right? That's the output we're referring to. And then we say dot emit. And what this does is it actually triggers this output. So if there's a component listening, like we just saw in our HTML file, if there's a component listening for the a event on our multiple choice component, then whatever logic it wants to happen when that event occurs will be called, all right? I'll do an example of that again in just a minute. So let's do emit for all of these events as well. We're just gonna say this.b.emit, this.c.emit, and this.d.emit. All right. So the next thing we're gonna do is inside our app component. Let's open that up. We're going to remove our event handling component, and then we'll put our multiple choice component in there. All right, and just like we saw before, what I'm gonna do is have a different thing happen for each of the possible events, right? So we have A, because that will call some corresponding method in our app component, all right? So we'll say something like do something. If we have B, we'll have do something else. We have C, maybe we want to do the same thing. Oops. And for D, we'll have do another thing. All right, so let's just go through and real quickly define these methods on our app component. Let's open that up here. And inside here, we're going to have do something like that. We'll display an alert. And then we'll have do something else and do another thing as well. All right. So now let's open up our component again. Whoops, and it looks like I misspelled this. So let's just correct that in here. There we go. Now, if we go through and click on these buttons, we'll see that they call the corresponding method in the app component, which is the parent component of the multiple choice component we just created. Okay, so we can see if we click on these things, it's the event will basically call the method on the parent component that the parent component specified. All right, and obviously this was a pretty simple example, but the same thing can apply to any other component we wanna create. Right, so you could have a component that you click on that tells your parent component when something's done loading, for example. Or you might create a form component that simply has an event that the parent component can listen for that contains all the form data when the users fill it out. All right, the possibilities here are pretty vast. Welcome to lesson two, learn about state and the component lifecycle. In this lesson, you learn the basics of working with the component state, as well as the various stages of the component lifecycle in Angular. By the end of the lesson, you'll know how to work with state effectively, as well as have an intuitive grasp of how Angular's component lifecycle works. Well, that's the basic plan of attack for this lesson. Let's get started.
Okay, so now that we've learned the basics of components in Angular, as well as how components interact with each other, we're going to move on to another very important topic in Angular, which is state. So basically, state is when our components in our application are able to keep track of their place and their history in an application. Right, so the typical example of this is a button that tells you how many times you've clicked it. And in fact, in order to demonstrate how state works in Angular, we're going to use that exact example. So what we're going to do is generate a new component by using ng generate component, and we'll call this the counter button component. And we'll hit enter and it will generate those four files for us. So let's open those up. Okay, so just to set up our counter button component initially, what we're going to do is we're going to give it a member variable that we're just going to call count. And that's going to start off at zero. All right, so just count number zero. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have a div here. And then inside a paragraph tag, we're just going to say the button has been clicked. And then we'll insert the value of count into here. And we'll say times. Okay, so the button has been clicked three times, for example. And then underneath that, what we're going to do is we're just going to put a button that says click me. So the question now is how do we keep track of this count variable inside our component? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is we're going to tap into our buttons click event and we're going to create a method inside our counter button components TypeScript file and we'll call it increment count and we'll say void since it doesn't return anything and then inside here all we need to do is increment the state of our count variable here we're going to say this dot count plus equals one okay and then we'll go back and add a call to increment count inside our button here. And then we just need to open up our app components HTML file. And instead of having app multiple choice in here, we're going to insert our counter button component. So we'll say app counter button like that. And now if we click on the button, we'll see that our component is keeping track of its state. And another thing to keep in mind as well is that if we have more than one of these components displayed on the page, each component is going to keep track of its own individual state. Okay, so that is the basics of state in Angular. In Angular, unlike in some of the other frameworks like React, state is implemented simply as a member variable like we see here of the class that corresponds to the component. All right, so we've seen how our components in Angular can keep track of state, and that's pretty straightforward. It's probably what a lot of you were expecting. But what we're going to talk about next is the concept of where to put state in our application. So it's pretty straightforward when you have a component like our counter button component here. Obviously, the state for keeping track of how many times our button has been clicked makes a lot of sense to put it inside of our counter button component. But as it happens, this isn't always the case. It's not always going to be this clear where to put the state for some piece of our application. As an example of what I'm talking about, let me show you an example. We have our counter button here, and let's say that when a user reaches a certain number of clicks, we want to show some kind of message that says, I don't know, congratulations or something like that. And furthermore, let's say that we want that congratulations message to be a separate component outside of the counter button component. Okay, so let's just set up our application so that that will be the case and I'll show you what the problem is. So let's generate our congratulations message component. We'll just say ng generate component congratulations message. And there we go, it generates our component for us. So let's open up those files, HTML and TypeScript. And there we go. So this component doesn't need to be anything fancy. 
literally all we're going to do is just add an H1 tag here that says congratulations like that. And now let's go to our app component and we're just going to insert that congratulations component we just created. So let's say app congratulations message like that. And if we go back, we're going to see congratulations. So here's the thing. Obviously, we want to hide this congratulations message until the user actually reaches the specified number of clicks. So how do we do that? Well, as it turns out, there's not really an easy way to do this, keeping the state where it's at right now, right? That is in our counter button components TypeScript file. And the reason for this is that both our counter button component and our congratulations message component have the app component as their parent, right? They're both right here. And as a rule, components in Angular can't directly share state, right? So for example, from our congratulations message component, we can't just say something like, you know, if counter button component dot count is greater than 10 or something like that. We can't say that because there's not really any way for us to access that component inside our congratulations message component. So the way that this is usually solved is by doing something that I usually refer to as hoisting the state, right? Basically, this is where we take the state from one of the child components and we move it into its parent component in order to allow it to share its state more effectively with other components that need it. So in our case, what that would look like would be something like this. We would actually open up our app components TypeScript file. We would add a count member variable to it. We would say count number equals zero. And then what we would do is we would actually move all the logic from around this thing up from our counter button component into our app component. All right, so we would take this increment count method. We would put it inside our app component. All right, and we can delete these other methods that were being used by one of our example components earlier in the course. And now what we need to do is since our counter button component still needs access to the value of the count, and we still need to actually increment the count whenever the user clicks on the button inside the counter button component, what we're going to need to do is actually change this so that it's an input. All right, so we're going to need to import input up at the top here. Rephrase, we're going to change this to at input with parentheses count number like that. And we'll just give it a default value of zero. Now it's important to note that this default value we're giving it is only going to be the actual value if we're not passing in this input to the component, right? And that's really just more to keep the linter happy than anything that would realistically happen in our app right now. So now that that's an input, what we can do is we can go into our app components HTML file and we can pass the count member variable from our app component right here into our counter button component by saying in square brackets count. Remember, this is how we pass non numeric values as inputs. We're going to say count count just like that. All right. And if we go back here, we're going to see it says zero times. And just to prove that this is actually working, let's change this from zero to two. And we'll see that our counter button component is now displaying only the value of the input that the app component is passing to it. All right, so the next step of this hoisting the state game is that we need to actually create an output on our counter button component that will be triggered whenever the user actually clicks on the button. That's what we're going to have trigger our app components increment count method. So let's change that back to zero there. And let's go into our counter button component and import both output and event emitter. And what we're going to do is we're going to define an output here. And we'll call this output something like button clicked. And we're going to assign it a value here. Just like we did in an earlier example, we're going to say equals new event emitter. And we don't need to assign any type to it. We're just going to say void. And then what we're going to need to do is add some sort of on click method to our counter button component that will then trigger this button clicked output. So we're just going to say this dot button clicked dot emit like that. 
And then we're gonna go into our counter button components HTML file, and we're gonna change click to on click or something like that. And then inside our app components HTML file, we can now tap into the output from our counter button. And the way we do that is by saying button clicked. And then we can call our increment count method that we defined in our TypeScript file. Okay. So let's first just check if this works. We see that everything is working just like before. And the beauty of this now is that since we move this state up into a parent component, we're now able to actually use this count to determine when the congratulations message should and should not be shown. So if we go into our app components HTML, what we can do is we can add an ng if structural directive to our app congratulations message component here. And we can just say ng if, and we can say count. And then we're gonna say if count is greater than 10. And now we see that our congratulations message is hidden until we reach 11 clicks, at which point it shows the congratulations message since the count is now greater than 10. And a way that we could take this even further is if we were to pass the count into our app congratulations message component. All right, so if we gave it its own input called count, pass the count into that. And then we're also gonna pass in a threshold input, right, which we'll define up in our app component as well. So that will determine when the congratulations message component actually shows up. And then down in our congratulations message component, we're gonna define those two inputs we just created. All right, so we're gonna say input count and input threshold. And we'll have the default value for that be something like 10. And then inside our congratulations message components HTML, this is where we're gonna add the ng if directive. And we're gonna say if count is greater than threshold. All right, and that should be all we need to do. So let's give this another try. Let's click the button so many times. And then the last thing we need to do is actually define the threshold inside our app component. So we're gonna define that here. We're gonna say threshold number, and we're gonna set that equal to 10. All right, so now if we click on our button 11 times, once it gets above that threshold that we've set, we see the congratulations message. And if we set this to a different number, right? If we wanted to set it to five, for example, we see that that works as well. So anyway, to summarize everything that's going on here, the state, right, the count that we've defined is now inside our app component, which is the parent component of our counter button and our congratulations message components. And what's happening is it's passing down that state to both the congratulations message component and the counter button component. The counter button component gets that as an input. All right, we see it here. And that's what it displays here in its HTML. And then when we actually click on the button, so this basically takes the same path as the count state, except in the reverse direction. It goes up. When we click on that button, it calls this on click method, which emits this button clicked event. And since our app component is listening for that here, it's gonna call the app components increment count method. And that increment count method is going to increment the actual count state, which then will be passed back down to the children components and re-rendered. Okay, so now that we've talked about state in components, the next thing we're gonna talk about is something called the component life cycle. Now the component life cycle is basically a series of events that occur in each component that gets rendered to the screen that we can tap into in order to perform certain pieces of logic at certain times. If you've been looking closely at the components that we've been creating, you've probably already noticed the first life cycle method and the most commonly used one, which is ng on init. All of the lifecycle methods start with this ng prefix just to make sure that they don't interfere with any of the other methods we might wanna to add to our components. So basically from the time that a component is first created 
to the time that it's removed from the screen, there are a lot of different events that take place. And there's a life cycle method for each of these events that we can actually put logic in, right? Whenever we need to do something specifically at that time. And you can actually see a list of all the different life cycle methods on Angular's website under life cycle hooks here. And they have a description of the purpose of each of these life cycle methods and the timing of each one. So you can read all about that if you want, but really the two main ones that we're going to use, the two main ones that I use almost exclusively are the ng on init method and the ng on destroy. Now, in order for these methods to actually be called at the right time, our component, as you may have noticed up at the top here, has to actually implement different interfaces that will make sure that those methods get called at the right time. So for the ng on init method here, our component needs to implement on init in order for it to call on destroy. We need to import the on destroy interface up here. And we need to add that to the interfaces that our component implements. Okay, so let's add our ng on destroy method as well. It's going to look like that. And just for fun here, let's add an alert to both of these so that we can see when both are called. Now, I want to just point something out. We're using an alert here, but in general, you do not want to put alerts inside the lifecycle methods of a component since they block the entire thread until the user actually interacts with the alert, right? So we're just doing this here for the sake of example, but this is not something you'll normally want to do. So we're going to say alert, and we'll just say in ng on init, like that. And then underneath that, in ng on destroy, we're going to say in ng on destroy. All right, so if we go back to our app and refresh it, we're going to see that before our components even rendered to the screen, we get this alert saying in ng on init, right? So ng on init is called even before our component is actually rendered to the DOM where we can see it. So it's not until we click OK here that our component's actually going to show up. Now, you might be wondering, how do we get ng on destroy to occur? Well, there are a few ways we can do that. One is if you're using a router and you go to a different route, that will basically destroy all the components that were on the previous page. But since for now we only have one page, what we're actually going to do is create a way for us to remove our counter button component from the DOM. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to go into our app component. We're going to add a button that we'll be able to click to hide and show our counter button component. All right, so we're going to say button. We'll tap into the button's click event, and we're going to create a method called toggle counter button. And for the text here, we'll just say show hide counter button. Okay. And then inside our app components TypeScript file, we're going to add a member variable called show counter button, which is going to be a Boolean. And it's going to start off as true. And then we're going to add the method that we referred to earlier, which is going to be called toggle counter button. It's going to be void. And inside here, we're going to say this dot show counter button equals not this show counter button. So we're basically just inverting the show counter button variable there. And the last thing we need to do now that we have that member variable is on our app counter button component, we're going to use the ng if directive to only show it if the show counter button member variable of our app component is true. Okay. So with this, you should see if we hide it, we're going to see now in ng on destroy as our app removes our counter button component from the DOM, right? The, that on destroy method gets called. And then if we show it again, we'll see it calls ng on init. We click OK and our component shows up. Okay, so that's the ng on init and ng on destroy methods. It's worth mentioning what these methods are actually used for. So the ng on init method 
The primary thing that it's used for is to load data initially into our components. All right, so if you need to make any kind of network request, which we're gonna see later on in the course, this is generally where you'll end up doing that inside this ng on init method. And as far as ng on destroy, the primary thing that we're gonna to wanna to do here is cancel any subscriptions or any intervals or any timeouts that we set so that we don't have some kind of memory leak after the component that was using those things has been destroyed. Okay, so that's generally what we'll do inside ng on destroy. Now you might be wondering also why we have to bother with this ng on init thing for loading our data, right? You might be wondering why we can't just load our data inside the components constructor. And furthermore, you might be wondering why we haven't actually even used this constructor yet. And that's something that we'll see later on what this constructor is actually used for. But the reason that we don't want to load data inside this constructor and we want to load it inside this ng on init method instead is because loading data and doing the kind of things that we'll generally do inside ng on init, and because of the way that Angular works behind the scenes, we need our components to be very easy to create. And if we're doing things like loading data inside the constructor, that kind of goes against that necessity, right? So as I said before, the ng on init and ng on destroy lifecycle methods are gonna be the main ones you're gonna use. There are other ones if you wanna read about them, but honestly, most Angular developers don't use these enough for it to really warrant an explanation here. Generally, nine times out of 10, ng on init and ng on destroy are gonna be all you need. So if you need to use those, remember just implement the corresponding interface like this. Welcome to lesson three, learn routing in Angular. In this lesson, you get an extensive overview of the topic of routing in Angular, that is, having our web applications respond and display appropriately in response to changes in the user's URL. By the end of the lesson, you'll have a firm grasp on how to incorporate routing into your Angular applications. So we start off this lesson by looking at how to install and set up routing in Angular, and we then move on to see how to use both URL and query parameters in our Angular applications. Additionally, we're also going to take a look at how to pass props to route components and how to navigate programmatically. So with routing being such an important topic in virtually every Angular web application, this is definitely a lesson that you're not going to want to miss. So let's get started. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna take a look at in this course is how routing works in Angular. In most of our Angular applications, we're gonna want different components and pages of our application to be displayed as the user navigates to different routes in their browser. So if the user were to go to localhost 4200 slash counter button, for example, we might wanna display the counter button. We might also wanna have something like slash products that shows products of our application, slash, which shows the info of the user that's logged in, Basically, we want to display different things in our application depending on the path, right, the URL that we have up at the top of our browser. And the way we do that in Angular is by using something called Angular Routers. And we looked at this file very briefly a little earlier in the course, but let's open up approuting.module.ts in our IDE here and take a look at it. So here's the file where we basically define all of the routing logic for our application. And you can see here that this is basically just where the routing module is set up. It basically just imports a few things from Angular's core and router packages and sets some things up at the bottom. But almost exclusively, the part that we're going to be concerned with in this file is gonna be this routes array here, which is where we define all of the different routes of our application. That is, that is we define all of the different URLs that our application is gonna support and the different components that we wanna display at each of those URLs. So let's just jump right in and see what this looks like more or less. So, so we've created quite a few different example components throughout this course so far. And what we're gonna do in order to allow ourselves to actually see all of these components without having to actually go in and edit the code is we're gonna create a different route for each one of these components inside this routes array. So we're gonna have a route that displays the counter button example that we created. We're gonna have a route that displays the event handling example, our other example, rephrase, our first basic example component here, 
our multiple choice, people list, etc. Here's what this is all going to look like. So let's start off by creating a route for our counter button example. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to add an object to this routes array. And this object is going to have two properties. The first property is going to be called path. And this is where we define the last part of the URL that we want this route to apply to. All right, so since we want to display our counter button example inside here, we're just going to have the path be counter button. All right. And the second property is component. And this is where we specify the component that we want to be displayed at this route. All right, so let's import our counter button component. We're going to say import counter button component from, and we're going to import it from dot slash counter button slash counter button dot component. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to specify this counter button component as the component property of this route object. So we're going to say counter button component. Okay. And what this will do is it'll display our counter button component only when the path in the browser is slash counter button. And before I show you what this looks like, there's a few things that we just have to fix up here. The first one is in our counter button component TypeScript class. We're going to go in and actually remove the alerts from ng on init and ng on destroy so that those don't keep bothering us when we try and refresh our app. And the second thing we're going to do is inside our app.component.html file, we're going to delete everything except for the router outlet. Okay, so we're going to delete all of these things and the router outlet is all that's left. So earlier in the course, I said that I would explain what the router outlet does. What this router outlet thing does is it displays the component that we specified for whatever the current path is in our app routing module file. All right, so that's all it does. It's just sort of a place on the page that our app will replace with whatever the current component for the current route is. So if we go back now and take a look at our app, we're going to see that nothing shows up. That's because we're not currently at the counter button route. But if we go in here and type in slash counter button and hit enter, we'll see that our counter button component shows up. And it's not going to work right now because remember we were having the app component manage its state. So what we can do is we're going to actually generate a counter button page component to hold that component and manage its state and everything for it. We're just going to basically copy and paste all the logic from our app component for that. So let's say ng generate component and we'll just call it counter button page. And inside our app routing module, we're going to change this from counter button component to counter button page component. And the same thing here. And the same thing here. Okay. And we're going to change that then to counter button page component. And then we're going to open up our counter button page component and our app component TypeScript files. And all we're going to do is copy and paste the counter button logic, right? So everything inside our app component here, we're just going to cut that out, save it. And then we're just going to paste that in our counter button page component. And let's just move a few things around here. Let's move these methods down beneath these. And we're also going to have to display the HTML. So if you go back to our app component where I had you delete everything, hopefully you can undo that and copy and paste that out and then paste it inside your counter button page component, just like that. And now if we go back and take a look at our app, we see that our counter button works. All right. We can show and hide it. We can keep clicking and there you have it. Okay, so that's our first page, and it's a pretty common pattern in Angular to create just a separate page component that takes care of managing the state for the page. And this is also where you'll usually do things like load data. All right, but in this situation, we did it just because we needed something to manage the state for our counter button. So we won't necessarily be doing that with all of our examples. So let's open up our app routing module file again and add some more routes. So we have our counter button page route now. The next one, let's do our event handling page. So we're going to say path event handling. We're just going to have these paths be identical to the name of the component directory here. All right. And then for that, we're going to say component 
and we're gonna have to import the event handling component. We're gonna say import event handling component from event handling slash event handling dot component. And for the component, we're gonna pass event handling component. All right, and now if we go back to our app and navigate to event handling and hit enter, we'll see that that shows our event handling component that we created earlier in the course. All right, so we have our event handling component. Next one up is the original example component. We're just gonna say example. And for that one, we're gonna say component example component. And actually, I just realized that it'll do this depending on your IDE settings. If you let it autofill for you, it'll actually import that component for you, which saves us a little bit of typing. All right, so we have our example component. Let's do our multiple choice component. All right, so we're gonna say path multiple choice component multiple choice component. And the last one's gonna be the people list component. So we're gonna say people dash list component people list component. Okay, so let's just do a brief tour. We're gonna to have our example component, right? Which just says, hello, nothing too complex there. We're gonna have our multiple choice component. All right, which contains these here. And last but not least, we have our people list component, which is not showing because we had this show list thing. So let's just change that to true. That was from when we were demonstrating the ng if structural directive. See how far we've come so far. So now that we've changed that to true, we're gonna see our people list displayed. So we have all of our routes for our application. And if you wanted to do something like create a blog and show, you know, a welcome page, different article pages, a contact page, all those kind of things, all you would do for that is just create a different component for each of those pages and add a route for each of those things to your routes array here. And one last thing that I wanna show you is, is that usually when people visit our site, they're just gonna go straight to our site without explicitly typing in some sort of path after the name of our website, right? So if you wanna have all of the routes like we have here where none of them is just uh, you know, the home route, what you can do is you can have a route that will specifically redirect users to one of the other routes. All right, so here's what that's gonna look like. If we have just an empty route, which is just gonna be the, you know, home route, like if we go to here, we're gonna say path, it's just gonna be an empty string. And we're just gonna specify the path that we want users to be redirected to now. So we're gonna say, let's have it redirect to the counter button example, since that's the most interesting one so far. And one last thing that we're gonna add here is something called path match full. And what this does is it makes sure that this path here, this home route path, as it's usually called, the way that a lot of times paths are checked, just because of the checking logic for the paths, a lot of times we have to specify that we only want it to match if it looks like that, okay? So in our case now, if we try and go to the home route, we're gonna see that it'll automatically direct us back to the counter button page. Okay, so now that we've seen the basics of routing in Angular, we're gonna talk about something called URL and query parameters. Now, most of you probably already know what URL and query parameters are, but just for those of you who don't know, URL and query parameters, what they are are there extra pieces of information about the page that we put in the URL, right? So when we created our counter button route, we just typed in slash counter button and it showed us our component. And that's great, but there are a lot of times when we'll want to be able to include extra information about the page, right, in that little box up at the top of the browser. So we're gonna talk about both URL and query parameters because they are slightly different things. The first one we'll talk about is URL parameters. So URL parameters are extra pieces of information about a given route that we can add as segments of the URL path. So an example of this, if you look at your profile URL on LinkedIn, this is mine here, you're gonna see that it's, you know, linkedin.com slash in 
slash, and then the ID of the user, right? And if you were to go to slash, you know, John Smith or slash whatever, someone else's name, then it would bring up their profile as well. And you can see here that we're passing in that information as an extra segment of the URL. And we'll see how to do this a little later on. So that's URL parameters. Query parameters, on the other hand, are like URL parameters, but instead of being found as segments of the path, so they actually come after the path of the route. And rephrase. So to show you what that looks like, so if you were to do a Google search for, you know, tallest building in the world, let's say, the URL that you would see up at the top, if you were to search this, would look something like this. And it would look actually a little different just because Google has its own kind of naming scheme. But it would say search, and then it would be followed by a question mark, and then you'd have some kind of variable name, in this case that would be Q, equals, followed by the actual value for that variable. So this is what query parameters look like. Right, they start off with a question mark. That basically tells the browser, okay, everything that comes after this is gonna be query parameters. And then we have a list of query parameters, each of which is gonna be, you know, some variable name equals, and then the value that we want to pass into that. Another example of this were to be, you know, if you were on Amazon, let's say, and you added some filters to your search, right? So let's say you searched for hats. That would be contained in the query parameters as well as if you added some filters to your search, such as, you know, max price of $20 and color green, chances are you would find those up in the query parameters as well. And the beauty of this, the nice part about query parameters is that they're not order dependent, right? URL parameters depend largely on order because you're passing in data as part of the path, right? As segments of the path. And the other advantage of this, not necessarily over URL parameters, but just an advantage of doing this in general, is that it allows us to share the exact state of an application at some point in time with someone else. So for example, if we had just searched this on Amazon, set the filters, etc., we could actually send that exact search with those exact filters just by copying and pasting the link. Okay, so that's one of the nice things about query parameters. So that's URL and query parameters. Let's take a look at how we actually use these things in Angular. So let's go back to our IDE here. And as an example here, let's generate another component. All right, so open up another terminal and we're gonna generate a component and we'll call this component something like params example. All right, so let's generate that component and open up the files that that generates. We'll open up our HTML and our TypeScript files. Now, the first thing we wanna do here is just, let's decide what our component is gonna look like. So, so the main goal for our component here is gonna be just for it to display certain URL and query parameters that we pass in, in the URL. So let's just have it all inside a div and Let's have a heading that says something like params. We'll have a subheading that says URL params. And we'll have another subheading that says query params. And that's as far as we'll get for now because we still don't have anything to display yet. So let's start with URL parameters. And the first step in using URL parameters is to define them inside the app routing module file. So let's open that file up again. And let's define a route for our params example component. We're gonna define that just like this. We'll say params example, and we'll say component params example component, which should import it for us. And in order for URL parameters to work, what we have to do is we actually have to specify them in the path that we define for our route. So if we wanted to be able to say something like, you know, params example, slash, I don't know, let's say we wanted to pass in an ID of a person, right? So params example, slash one, two, three. So if we wanted to pass in something like a user's ID, such as, you know, params example slash one, two, three. What we would do is we would actually add that segment into the path that we specify for our route. 
So in Angular, that's gonna look like this. We're gonna start off with a colon, right? That's how we tell Angular that we want that to be a URL parameter there. And we'll just call it something like URL param, okay? We'll just use the name URL param for that segment of the URL. Now, the way we get access to URL parameters once we've specified them in the app routing module file is a little interesting. We start off by importing something from the Angular router package. All right, so what that's gonna look like is we're gonna say import, and this thing is gonna be called activated route, and you'll see how we use that in a second. So we're gonna say import activated route from Angular slash router. And then in order to use this activated route thing, which is going to allow us to access the values of our URL parameters, what we actually do is we put it inside the parentheses of our constructor. And this is something called dependency injection in Angular, and it's a very, very common pattern in Angular applications. In order to allow our component here to use this activated route thing, we're just gonna say private route colon activated route, just like that. And what this does is it adds a route member variable to our component that we can then use to do things like get the value. So let me show you what I mean by that. If we have a member variable here called something like URL parameter, right? we'll just call it URL param, which is gonna be a string, and it's gonna start off as just an empty string. If we wanna set the value of this member variable to the value of the URL parameter, so in other words, if we want it to be one, two, three, if we were to type one, two, three in here, if we type in something else like this, we want it to be that, et cetera. What we're gonna do is use the activated route and inside ng on init, we're gonna say this.url param equals this.route, we're using the activated route here, dot snapshot dot param map dot get, and then the name that we specified for that parameter in our app routing module file, which is gonna be URL param. Okay, so we're gonna say get URL param. And we're also gonna to wanna to set a default value for it just in case the user doesn't put anything in. And to see if this is working, what we're gonna do now is under our URL params heading in our HTML file, we're just gonna have a little paragraph tag that says URL param and we'll say equals, and then we'll just put in the value of our URL param member variable. And now if we navigate to params example slash one, two, three, we're gonna see that it's parsing the value of that URL there and inserting it and setting the value of our URL param member variable and that's being displayed to the page. Okay, so that's how URL parameters work. We can always add more. Right, so if we wanted to add another one like that, we could do that as well. We could say another param string and we could do pretty much the same thing we did here. We could just copy this, paste it and say this dot another param and then change the name here as well and display that in the HTML. And now if we add another segment, so if we go to params example slash one, two, three, slash blah, 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 we'll just type in some letters there. We'll see that it correctly parses both of those, okay? And this can be used, for example, if we wanted to you know, display different articles, right? If we were building a blog site and we wanted to display different articles, so if we had, you know, React examples, so if we had Angular examples, or if we had, you know, full stack development article, we would just have the IDs of those articles up in the URL like that. We would parse those out and use those to load the correct articles information. Okay. So now that we've seen how to use URL parameters, let's take a look at query parameters. Query parameters are actually gonna be very similar. The way we get query params is again, using this activated route thing. 
And just to show you how this works, let's just log out our query parameters. We're gonna say console.log this.route.queryparams. All right, and that's where you'll get those from. So just to see what those look like, let's open up our inspector window here and go to the console. And if we add in params example, you know, we'll just go with the example that we used earlier. And then we're gonna type a question mark and we'll say something like one equals blah, 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 right? One is just gonna be the name of a query parameter. And then to join query parameters together, we're gonna put an ampersand symbol in between them. And then we can specify another one like two, for example, blah, 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 which will have another value. Put in another ampersand, we'll say three. And this one we'll put in some letters for something like that. And if we take a look at what we just printed out, we're gonna see that it actually has quite a few pieces of data besides just our query parameters here. So if we wanna to get to our query parameters, we just have to say this.route.queryparams.value. So in order to get the actual value of our query params, what we need to do, this is gonna look a little strange and I'll explain in just a minute what I'm doing, but we're gonna to have to say this.route.queryparams.subscribe. And then we're gonna pass a function here that takes params. And now if we print those out, like this. We're gonna see that that shows up in our console, okay? So the reason for this subscribe thing is that instead of simply accessing the query parameters directly, Angular wants us to design our components so that they just listen for changes in the query parameters. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to update our components instantly whenever we change one of these things. Right, whereas if we were to just try and access them directly, the Angular component wouldn't actually update unless we refresh the page. So let's add our parameters to our class here. We're just gonna make this an array of objects and it'll start off empty. And what we're gonna do inside of here is instead of saying console.log params, we're gonna actually get each of our parameters. We're gonna say object.keys and get all of the keys from our Params, and then we're gonna say dot map. And for each of our different parameters, what we're gonna do is return an object that we'll use to actually display it in the HTML that says name, which will be key, and value, which will be that key of our params. So we'll say params key. Oops, so we need to wrap this in parentheses so that that's valid JavaScript. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna set our params member variable up here to the result of this. So we're gonna say this dot params equals, there we go. Okay, and then in our HTML, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the ng4 directive. So we're gonna say paragraph, and then we'll have star ng4 equals, and we'll say let, we'll say param, rephrase, we'll say let param of params. And inside here, we'll just display the parameters name. So we'll say param.name equals param.value, okay? Oops, so we might have to go back and change this to any. And there we go. So we see that we have our URL parameters all printed out. And if we add more, right, if we add another ampersand and say message equals hello, we'll see if that shows up as well. And likewise, we can delete all of these and we won't have any. So that's how URL and query parameters work in Angular. Okay, so there's a few more things that I want to talk about with regards to routing in Angular. And the first thing, which we're gonna take a look at in this section, is gonna be implementing not found pages in Angular. All right, so you may have noticed in our app that if we try and navigate to a route that doesn't exist, it basically doesn't show anything. So what we can do, and what most websites will do, in fact, 
is they'll actually have a special page that users will see when they navigated to a route that doesn't exist, right? If they followed a broken link or something like that. And the way we do that in Angular is by adding a special route where the path is just two stars, right? That signifies that it should match basically any path. And for the component, well, we're actually gonna have to create our own component here. So let's open up our terminal and generate one. We'll call this component not found page. All right, and that will be the component that we display here. So we'll say not found page component, just like that. And then we just need to open up our not found page component. We'll just open up the HTML here, and we're just gonna have a heading that says page not found. All right, and there's a lot of cool things that I've seen done with this page, right? Like if you go to GitHub and just type in a random URL, you'll see what I mean. But basically now that we've implemented this page, if the user tries to go to a route that doesn't exist, they'll see the not found page. And it's as simple as that. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna talk about with routing in Angular for the time being is the topic of navigating from one page to another. There's actually two main ways that you can do this in Angular. One is using links like you're used to probably doing in just regular HTML, and the other is navigating programmatically. So let's start off by seeing how we can navigate using links in Angular. And to do this, basically all we're gonna do is just on our not found page that we just created, we're gonna add some helpful links that the user can click on to take them to a page that actually exists. All right, so we'll just have a link maybe to the counter button page, let's say. So the way that links work in Angular, they look very similar to the links that you'll find in regular HTML with one key difference, and I'll show you what that is right here. So let's say that we wanted to link to our counter button page again. We'd have an anchor tag, right, just A, and then we would say router link. Here's the difference from regular HTML. We'd say router link and then the path that we want to send the user to. So counter button, for example. And then we would make the link say something, right? So see my something like that. And then we'd basically be able to go here and click on it and it would send the user to the counter button page. So you might be wondering why we need to use router link instead of the regular href attribute that we would use in regular HTML. Well, the reason for this is that having a different attribute allows Angular to navigate between pages, between different routes in our application without actually reloading the page. So here's what I mean. If we change this to just href here and save the file, and let's go back to our not found page. If we click on this, you're gonna see up at the very top, very briefly, I'll do it again. You're gonna see that it actually reloads the page. And that can actually have some pretty significant effects on performance since when the app reloads, what that means generally is that we'll lose all of the data that we've loaded and we'll need to load it again from the server. So that's usually not what we want. So generally we'll use the router link instead. And when we're using the router link, if we go back, we're gonna see that it doesn't actually reload the page when we click on it, right? Right, so anyway, that's how to navigate using links in Angular. The, the other way to navigate is programmatically, that is just by calling a function from inside one of our components. And in order to show you what that looks like, let's just open up our counter button page component, just like that. Let's make it so that when the count gets above the threshold, it will navigate the user to another page. All right, just for the sake of example here. Well, the first thing we need to do in order to make this happen is we need to import something called router from the Angular router package. Okay, and just like we imported the activated route in our params example component, right? Just like we imported that and injected it into our component through the constructor, we're gonna do the exact same thing with this router that we're importing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say private router router. And then what we're gonna do is inside our increment count method, we're gonna to check to see if this.count is greater than 
this dot threshold. All right, so we're going to say if this dot count is greater than this dot threshold. In that case, we'll navigate programmatically to another page. And to do that, we use this router thing. We simply say this dot router dot navigate by URL. along with the path that we want it to navigate to. Okay, so for example, if we wanted it to send the user to, I don't know, the event handling page, let's say. We would just say event handling like that. And now if we go here and click on this, we'll see that when we get to the threshold, it'll send us immediately to the event handling route. So that's very helpful for situations where we need to actually navigate based on some kind of programmatic logic. This can also be used for doing things like making the user navigate after some data is loaded or things like that that don't involve the user actually clicking on a link in order to navigate. Welcome to lesson four, learn common angular patterns. In this lesson, we look at how to create a few common and very important components in Angular. By the end of the lesson, you'll have a good intuition of how to create these components from scratch, as well as how they fit in with Angular's syntax. So we start off this lesson by learning how to create forms in Angular, followed by how to build a navigation bar for our applications. And we then take a look at how to do things like load data and make network requests in Angular. So the things you learn in this section are very valuable and can end up saving you a lot of time in the long run. Let's get started. Okay, so the first example we're gonna look at here is the example of creating and managing forms in Angular. Obviously forms are a very important part of most websites, right? That's the primary way that users enter their data. So knowing how to create and manage forms effectively in Angular is going to be very important for us. Before we get started, though, I want to talk about the fact that there are two main methodologies for creating forms in Angular, and that is using something called controlled forms versus using something called uncontrolled forms. So let's talk about the difference here. In controlled forms, we explicitly track the state of our forms. So in other words, we'll have a component, right? That might be a, you know, user info form, let's say. And that component is gonna have member variables that explicitly track the values of the text inputs and whatever other inputs we have, right? So in other words, as the user interacts with the form, we can actually detect those changes in code and handle them ourselves. That's what controlled forms are. And it's usually the preferred way of doing things. Now, in contrast to controlled forms, we also have uncontrolled forms. With uncontrolled forms, we basically just let the DOM handle all of the forms functionality by itself. All right, so this is what you would probably see if you were to just write a pure HTML form, right? You would have a submit button, and when you click that submit button, only then does the information from that form actually get sent anywhere, right? We don't have, we're not tracking the values of those different inputs programmatically like we do with controlled forms. And as I said, controlled forms are generally going to be the preference here. I just wanted to highlight the distinction here because a lot of people come from the uncontrolled forms world and are kind of confused when we start controlling our forms. So let's head back to our IDE. And what we're going to do is implement a form in Angular. So first, let's generate a component for our form. We're going to say ng generate component. And we'll call this something like, we'll have it be user info form. All right, so that's gonna generate our user info form component for us. So let's open that up. And just before we get started here, let's also create a route for this component in our app routing module file. So we're just gonna add a route. We're gonna say path. We're gonna say user info form. And we'll say component user info form component, which will, again, automatically import that for us, depending, again, on your IDE settings. All right, and let's just head over here and take a look at it real quick to make sure everything's working. And sure enough, we see the boilerplate for our user info form. 
So for the HTML, for the basic DOM structure of our user info form, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. All we're gonna do is just have a div. Inside that div, we're just gonna have a heading that'll say something like user info. And then we'll have a series of labels and inputs. So we'll have label, we'll say something like name, and then we'll have an input. And the name of this input is gonna be name. And then we're gonna do the same thing for a few other pieces of data. Like we'll do age, I guess. Change the name here to age. And we'll also do hair color. Okay, so we have our inputs. And if we go back here, we'll see that they all show up. And the next thing we're gonna do is open up the TypeScript file of our user info form component. And we're gonna add a member variable for each of those inputs that we created, right? So we're gonna have name string, which is gonna start off as an empty string. We're gonna have age string, which is gonna start off as an empty string as well. And we'll have hair color, which will be a string as well, okay? So what we wanna do now is we wanna find a way to actually link the values of these member variables to the values inside these input boxes. Because right now, those are two completely separate things, right? They're not bound in any way. So the way that we usually go about doing this, and this will actually give us good experience with adding extra modules to Angular, is by adding something called the forms module to Angular. All right, and we'll see what that looks like in just a second. But before we do that, I wanna show you what it'll allow us to do. Basically what the forms module will let us do is when we have a form with a bunch of inputs in it like this and corresponding member variables, it will allow us to create a two-way binding between those things, all right? And it's gonna look like this. We have square brackets and inside those, we have parentheses along with the word ng model. All right, this is kind of a funny syntax for this, but that's just the way it is. And then what we do is we say equals along with the name of the member variable from the component that we want it to bind to. So in our case, that's gonna be name. We're gonna do that again for age. We're gonna say equals age. And we're gonna do that again here, where we'll say hair color. Okay, and in order to make these work, as I said before, we have to add a special forms module to our Angular project. And this is the first time we're gonna do something like this. What we need to do is we need to open up the app.module.ts file, and up at the top, we need to import something called forms module. All right, we're gonna say import forms module from at angular slash forms. Okay, and once we've done that, what we need to do is we need to go down to our imports inside this ng module decorator here. All right, we need to find imports, and to the bottom of that, we're gonna add forms module. And that's really all we need to do in order to make this work. So now, if we go back to our user info form component, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a button that will simply print out the values of the corresponding member variables here, just so we can make sure that everything looks good. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say button click, and we'll bind that to a method called print values. And we'll bind that to a method called display values. And our button will say display values. And then let's go back to our TypeScript file add our display values method. And we're just gonna make that display an alert, which will contain the name, age, and hair color, right? So we'll say name, this.name, age, this.age, and hair color, this.hair color. Okay, and now that we've done that, let's go back and actually test this, right? I'm just gonna enter something for the name. We'll enter something for the age. And we'll enter something for the hair color and we'll click display values. 
And it looks like we need to add some parentheses on the end of that. Let's try it again. And click display values and we'll see that it prints those out. Which again means that the values in our inputs are bound to the values of the member variables for our user info form component. And that's really useful since what that allows us to do is things like uh, we can do form validation, right? So we can check and make sure that the users entered correct values and display an error message if they haven't. And it also allows us to modify and process that data so that we can send it to a server of some kind. Okay, the next example of a very common pattern in Angular that we're going to look at is building a nav bar for our apps. So obviously having a nav bar in your application is pretty important. It really helps users get around and find the most important parts of your site. And implementing one in Angular is actually quite simple. So the first thing we're going to do is generate a nav bar component that we can use. So we're going to say ng generate component nav bar. All right, and once that's been generated, let's open up the component and take a look. Open up the HTML and the TypeScript. Okay, so the HTML for our navbar is going to look pretty similar to any other navbar that you would see in HTML. What it's going to look like is we're going to have a div, we're going to have an unordered list, and we're going to have different list items for each of the links we want to have in our navbar. So let's just add a few links to this. Right, and remember to do that, we're going to be using our special anchor tag that we use in Angular, where we use router link instead of href. So we'll have a link to our counter button example, which is going to look like that. We'll say counter button. And we're going to do the same thing for some of our other components. So let's just see which ones we want to do there. We'll have our event handling. We'll have our multiple choice. And that's all we need to do for now. You can add more if you want as practice, but for now, this is good enough to just see an example. All right, so we'll just change these. And there we go. Okay, so now that we have our navbar, really the only other thing we have to do is put it in our application in a place where we can just put it once and it won't be affected by the route. All right, so in other words, we could go into each of the individual components that we're displaying in different routes and add the navbar there, but then we'd have to obviously add the navbar in, you know, 10 different places. And in bigger apps, we might have to add the navbar in a lot more different places. Now, as it happens, the ideal place for this is actually inside the app components HTML file, right? Where right now we just have this router outlet that's displaying the different pages in our app. So what we need to do to display our navbar is we just need to say app navbar right outside the router outlet. And what that'll do is it'll display our navbar on all of the different routes, right? Because the only thing that's going to change is the content which is displayed inside the router outlet. And this is also a good place to display things like footers if we wanted to, right? So we could say something like, you know, copyright, something like that. And in both those cases, we can see that our navbar and footer continue to show up regardless of what route we're on, right? Even if we're on the not found page route, the navbar and the footer will still show up. Okay, so that's a pretty nice pattern in Angular to use. You know, basically just by putting stuff outside of router outlets, it ensures that it'll show up no matter what throughout our application. Okay, so the next common pattern that we're going to look at in Angular is how to load data and do things like make network requests from our Angular applications. So obviously this is going to be very important for any real world application, right? We need to be able to communicate with servers. We need to be able to load data from APIs and knowing how to do that in Angular obviously is a very important skill. So I'm going to show you how to do this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to generate a new component for the example we're going to create. And we're going to call this component user info display. 
It's basically just going to be a component that displays info for a user that we're going to load from a server, which I'll show you how to do shortly. Okay, so we have our user info display component. Let's open up the HTML and the TypeScript file for that. And basically what we're going to do, again, is we're going to have our user info display component load data from an API and display it inside its HTML here. We'll get there in just a second, but first let's actually add a route for our component. So open up app routing. Underneath here, we're going to say path. We'll say user info display as the path. And for the component, we're going to say user info display component. Okay, and now if we go to user info display, we'll see that it just displays that very basic component, which we haven't added anything to yet. Okay, so Let's talk about loading data in Angular. In order to load data in Angular, there are two things we need. The first is something called services. And this is actually a very important concept in Angular, which I'm gonna to explain to you here. So basically, Angular services are like Angular components, except they don't have any corresponding HTML that's rendered to the page. Okay, so if you wanna think of them as components without a DOM, think about them that way. So that brings up the question then, if services aren't rendered to the page, what is it that we actually use them for? Well, the main thing that we're gonna be using services for in this course is as a place to put the logic for communicating with our servers, right? Services are generally where we're gonna put logic for doing things like loading data and making network requests. So in order to see what services look like, let's generate one for ourselves. And generating services is just like generating components, except instead of saying ng generate component, we say ng generate service along with the service name. So we're gonna call this service user info. And again, resist the temptation to put service in the name since Angular will automatically add that to whatever name we put here. So we're gonna say ng generate service user info. And you're gonna see that that will only generate two files. And furthermore, those two files that it generates will be directly inside the app directory. All right, so we have our user info service spec file, which is the tests, and we have our user info service file, which we'll take a look at in just a second here. Okay, so in other words, Angular by default doesn't put service files into their own folder like it does for components since there's only two of them. So now that we've generated a service, let's take a look at what the file for that looks like. So the first thing to note here is that instead of this decorator at the top of our user info service saying component, as it did in all of our component files, right? If we open up our user info display component here, right? We see that this says component, but this one, however, says injectable. And what this means is that our service can be injected into any of our components in the components constructor method, just like we saw with things like Angular's activated route or router. Okay, so if we take a look at where we did that with our counter button page, for example, we see that we injected this router into our counter button page component via the constructor, okay? And as you'll see in just a minute, we'll be able to do the exact same thing with the services we create, which makes doing things like loading our data highly reusable. Cool, so we have our service now, which is gonna load user info, and we have the component that's gonna actually use the service and display the info that it loads. So let's create a method on our user info service that we can call in order to tell it to actually start loading data from the server. All right, so we're just gonna call this load data. And for now, we'll just have it be void, but we will be changing this type in just a minute here. So before we go any further, I wanna show you the API that we're gonna be loading data from. The API is called randomuser.me, and you can get to that by just typing that in a browser. And what it does is it'll generate random users for us that we can use for testing purposes in our application. 
Okay, and that can be pretty handy since it means we don't have to actually generate all this fake user data. We can just use this API. And I found that it's very good for doing demonstrations like this as well. So we're going to be loading data from that API. And in order to do that in Angular, we need one more piece. All right, so we talked about services, which is the first part. The second part is that we need to add two other tools to Angular. One of those is called RxJS, and the other one is called HTTP Client. Okay, so in order to add HTTP Client to our app, we need to open up App Module. We need to import it just like we did with our forms earlier. All right, so we need to say import HTTP Client Module. from angular slash common slash HTTP. And make sure you don't capitalize all of the letters in HTTP as well. I've made that mistake plenty of times. All right, and then down here, we're gonna add that to the imports. And now we can use the HTTP client module inside our service. And the way we do that is by saying private HTTP Right, so we can inject things into our services just like we can do with our components. All right, so we're gonna say private HTTP, HTTP client, and well, my IDE just automatically imported that for me, but if you need to import that yourself, it's import HTTP client from Angular common HTTP. All right, so the way that we load data using this HTTP thing that we just set up, and this is where the other thing that I mentioned, RxJS will come in, is we simply say this.http dot get and then we pass in the url that we want to load our data from and in our case since we're loading it from a third-party api we're going to say https colon slash slash random user dot me slash api all right and this will send us back data for a randomly generated user now your first inclination might be to just say return for this here but Actually, Angular doesn't work like that, right? Things like loading data and other long-running tasks in Angular applications are not done synchronously. So what this means is that we need to actually subscribe to this event, and Angular will tell whoever the subscriber is when this event completes. So just to show you what I mean, the way we do this, and again, this is where RxJS comes in, is that this HTTP.get thing here returns something called an observable, all right? And basically what an observable is, is it's just something that we can call dot subscribe on like that. And whatever function we pass to it, it will call when this event completes with whatever data it completed with. Okay, so if we wanted to say subscribe, and for now, we'll just print out the data. We're just gonna say console.log data so that we can see what exactly it is that we're getting back from our API. And before that will actually work, of course, we have to add this user info service to our user info display component. And the way we're gonna do that is by importing our user info service. From user info service. And then we're gonna inject it into our user info display component by saying private user info, user info service. Okay. And now that we've done that, what we're gonna do is inside our ng on init method, which is gonna be called when our component is created, we're gonna say this dot user info dot load data. And we're just gonna leave it at that and see what happens. So let's, open up our console here so that we can see the output and we're gonna refresh our page. And what we'll see is this thing printed to the console that has info, it's got results right here. And we're gonna see that that is the fake user data that we got from the API, okay? And yours obviously is gonna be a little different since it generates a different user completely for each request we send. So we know now that in order to get the user data out of the results, we just need to say data.results, and it's gonna be the zero index of that. 
Oops, and we do need to specify some generic types on here in order for that to work correctly. Okay, and if we run it again, we'll see that we have exactly what we wanted. So now what we need to do, right, currently we're just loading our data and printing it out to the console inside this function. But what we want to do is we want to somehow give our user info display component access to this information, right? We want it to have access to the results that we're getting here. And as a matter of fact, what we need to do, all we need to do, in fact, is we need to just cut this out and return the return value of this get function, which, as I said, is an observable. So what we need to do is we just need to change this now to tell Angular that we're returning an observable of type any. And of course, we need to actually import observable, which we can do up here by saying import observable from rxjs. And now what we can do is we can say this.userinfo.loadData inside our user info display component, and we can add dot subscribe onto the end of that. All right, so if we reload our page again, we're gonna see that we get the same data here, except now we're printing that data from inside our user info display component, which is great because that means we can assign it to a member variable and display it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say user info. That's just gonna be of type any. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say info and that is just gonna be type any. It's gonna start off as an empty object. And then inside the subscribe method, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say this dot info equals data results index zero. Okay, and now if we wanna actually display this, we're gonna go inside here and we're just gonna display a few of the properties that were in there. And actually we need to print that out again, so let's it's just so we can see what exact properties this data contains. So we're going to say console.log data results zero. All right, so we'll print out their email first. So we'll say paragraph email info.email. We'll print out their name as well, which has first and last name here. So we'll say name.first, name.last. All right, so we'll say name, info.name.first, info.name.last. And we're gonna see also that it'll print out this error, right? because it's trying to access name.first when info.name doesn't yet exist. And the way that we can remedy that is by having another member variable called is loading, which is gonna be a Boolean, and that's gonna start off as true until we've loaded our data when we're gonna set it to false. So here we'll say this dot is loading equals false. Okay, and then we'll use that member variable to simply hide this until everything is loaded. So we'll say ng if not is loading. And that will handle it for us, right? So we can see that the email and name are being displayed. Feel free to go through here and display whatever other data you want, but that's the basic strategy behind loading data in Angular. Welcome to lesson five, write clean Angular code. So far we've seen how to do many things in Angular, and in this lesson we take a focused look at how not to do things in Angular. That is, we're gonna take a look at some common Angular anti-patterns and how to avoid them. By the end of the lesson, you'll have seen some of the most common traps that new Angular programmers tend to fall into, as well as how to fix or avoid them in your own code. So in this fairly brief lesson, there are three main things we're gonna talk about. We're gonna start off by talking about inheritance and composition in Angular and how they differ, and then talk about how to apply the single responsibility principle. 
Finally, we close out by talking about how to avoid common anti-patterns in Angular. Well, that's about it, so let's get started. Okay, so the first best practice we're gonna talk about is using composition instead of inheritance. So first of all, let's talk about what I mean by inheritance. You've probably noticed by now that all of the components we've defined, let's just pick one at random, like our navbar component here. You've probably noticed that all of the components are expressed as classes. And the next logical step for many people, uh, many of you who are familiar with object-oriented programming, would be to actually use these classes and create these inheritance hierarchies, right? Create subclasses of these components, things like that. And the thing is that in Angular, that's usually not a good idea. We usually prefer to use something called composition instead. So in order to show you the difference between inheritance and composition, I'm just gonna go through a very simple example here with you. We're gonna create a button component and then create subclasses of that component for different situations, such as you know, showing a danger button or showing a success button, that kind of thing. So let's start off by generating three new components. The first one is gonna be a button component. We'll just say ng generate component button and hit enter. The next component we're gonna generate is gonna be a danger button component. So we'll say ng generate component and we'll call it danger button. And the third one is gonna be a success button. So we'll say ng generate component success button. Okay, so let's start by opening up our regular button component. This is gonna be a very simple example here, so don't dwell too much on the fact that we normally wouldn't create just a simple button component like this. So first of all, we're gonna give our button two inputs. So let's import our input from Angular Core. And the first input that we're gonna give our component will be the color for the button, okay? So in other words, we'll be able to pass in a hex string and that will be applied directly to the button. Okay, so we're gonna say at input, and we'll actually call this background color just so we don't get confused with the text color CSS attribute. And we're just gonna set the default value for that of blank. And the second input will be the text that we wanna display in the button. I'll show you a better way of doing this later on in the course, but for now, we're just gonna pass this in as an input. Okay, so now that we have those two inputs, let's head over to our button HTML file. And it's gonna look something like this. We're gonna say button. Inside the button, we're gonna just display the text input like that. And we're gonna have a style tag where we'll display the background color input that we had for the button. Just like that. Okay. Okay, so now that we have our button, let's see how we would actually display it. So let's open up our app component HTML file, just because that's the easiest place to put it. And right here under the nav bar, we'll say app button, right? That's our button component that we just created. And then we're gonna say text equals, and then we'll say something like success, right? And then for the color, we'll display just a bright green, which will look something like that. We'll just say 00FF00. Terrible color, but it'll work for our purposes here. All right, so now that we have our button, let's say ng serve. And let's open up our app in a browser. Oops, and this should actually be BG color instead of just color. And there we go. We see that it's now that bright green color. So let's say that we had this button component in our app several different times, right? And that we had several different colors that we used regularly, right? Like this success color. Let's say maybe we also had a danger color, right? Something like this, where we wanted to say danger. And that would just be a bright red color. Right, and let's say that we used the success and danger buttons so frequently that we decided to create our own components for those so that we didn't have to pass in the hex code for that every single time. 
Well, at this point, we would have two different ways of going about it, right? Using inheritance or using composition. Let me show you what inheritance would look like first of all. So let's open up our danger button, TypeScript file, and also our success button, TypeScript file. And if we were gonna use inheritance for these buttons, what that would look like is we would make them extend the regular button component. Okay, so we would say extends button component. Okay, and we'd have to import that. My IDE just did that for me automatically. And then inside the constructor, what we would do is, first of all, we have to call super just because we need to initialize the super class, the button component in this case. That's just, that's just something you have to do when you extend classes in TypeScript. And then underneath that, all we would do is we would just say this.bgColor equals, and then we could pass in the bright red color for our danger button. Okay. And then up here for the template, since we would want this danger button to have the exact same template as our button component, we would just replace this with the path to our button component. So we would say button slash button.component.html. And the last thing we'd wanna do is we would either want to set the text on the danger button to always be danger, right? So we could just say this dot text equals danger, or we could just add an input, but we'll just do it this way since it's simpler. So, okay, so now that we have our danger button, all we would need to do is just display that in our app component, and that would look like this. We would just say app danger button. Okay, and we would see if we go back that our danger button is right there, and that if we wanted to use it now in several different places in our app, I'll just show it in several different places just for demonstration, but all we would have to do is add the danger button. And the nice thing there is that instead of having to go through and replace the hex color on each and every danger button, if we wanted to change the danger color of our application, right? All we would need to do is go into our danger button class and just change this one thing here, all right? And we could always do the same thing for the success button as well, right? If we just made this extend the button component, Okay, and call our super class, and we would say this.bgColor equals, then we would do that bright green color, and we would do the text to say something like success, right? And then we could display the success button inside our app as well. So let's delete these extra danger buttons here, and display app success button like that. Oh, and one other thing is we need to set it to the template of the button component. So we need to say button slash button dot component dot HTML. All right, and now we see that the success button shows up there. And again, if we were using this success button all over our application and we wanted to change the color, which it's a pretty nasty color, so we probably would. So we would just have to adjust that in this one place, okay? So what we've done here using inheritance with our components works, but I'm gonna show you a better way to do this, right? Creating inheritance hierarchies using components can tend to be fairly cumbersome in Angular compared to this alternative that I'm gonna show you. And that is using something called composition, okay? so. Composition sort of takes inheritance and flips it on its head. So instead of our components like our success button component and our danger button component extending our button component, what they're gonna do instead is they're actually going to directly use the button component and configure it in a certain way. I'll show you what I mean by that. It's sort of subtle difference, but you'll see how it helps us and how it's much easier than what we just did here with the inheritance. All right, so first of all, let's just undo all the code that we put in our danger button and our success button components. All right, I'm just gonna hold down control Z till we get back to the beginning. And to use composition for these components now instead of inheritance, all we have to do, it's actually incredibly simple compared to what we just did with you know creating a subclass, calling super, blah, blah, blah. 
All we have to do is go into the HTML file of these components, for example, our danger button component, and use our button component passing in some specific set inputs to it. All right, so in other words, in order to have our danger button display a specific version of our button component, literally all we have to do is just say app button in the HTML file, and then we say text danger and bg color equals, and then we would do that nasty danger color. And that's all we would have to do for the danger button component. The success button component would look pretty much the same. So let's open that up as well. And for that, we would just say app button text equals success and bg color equals that bright green color for our success button. Okay, and now if we go back and look at our app, we'll see that that gives us exactly the same result with really a lot less code. And it gives us the same benefit where if we wanted to go back and change the color of all the success buttons in our application, we could just come in here and change that to something else, right? So that's just a very brief example of how we can use composition instead of inheritance with our Angular components. Okay, the next best practice we're gonna talk about in Angular is to do our best to always apply what's called the single responsibility principle. Okay, now there are actually several different definitions of the single responsibility principle, depending on who you talk to. But my definition is this, that components and services or whatever piece we're talking about of an Angular application should do one and only one thing. In other words, we should do our best to make sure that the responsibility is pretty evenly distributed across our application and that all our components are only doing things that they're really supposed to be doing. Now, as it happens, because most of the examples we've been doing so far have been fairly simple, uh, we've done a pretty good job of following this, right? If we open up, let's say our counter button component, it's really only doing one thing. And likewise, if we open up our counter button page, Really all this page is doing is, is just facilitating the communication between the counter button and the congratulations message, okay? And when I say that components and other pieces should do one and only one thing, I don't mean that they should only have like one line of code or one logical statement in them. What I mean is that just from a conceptual point of view, they should really only have one main responsibility. And if there's any other responsibilities that they're taken care of, we should generally just create another component or another piece or, you know, move logic around to make it that way. So to show you what I mean, let's take a look again at our user info display component, right? Remember that this component in conjunction with our user info service basically is loading data from this random user.me API that I showed you. And we've done a pretty good job of following the single responsibility principle here, right? We don't have our user info display component loading its own data, right? That actual logic here is in the user info service. But one thing that we could do a little better is that our user info display component has a good bit of logic that's based around sort of deconstructing the response that we get back from the API, right? Uh, so our user info display component knows the exact structure of the response we're getting, and it has to itself call data.results and then index zero. And furthermore, once we've got that, which contains the user data, in the HTML file, we're deconstructing it even further to get, you know, name.first, name.last, info.email, et cetera. And in general, what this means is that if we wanted to display, you know, the user's name and email elsewhere in the application, right? Let's say we had another kind of user profile component or something like that. We would have to duplicate this logic over again there in order to show the same thing. All right, and this is kind of an interesting side effect and reason behind using the single responsibility principle is that it generally ends up increasing code reuse since our components aren't you know, getting bogged down in logic that they shouldn't really be doing. So to show you what I mean and to show you how we can make this better, 
what we're going to do is we're going to actually move this logic into the user info service and I'm going to show you how to do things like transform the data so that we can get it in a way where any of our components can just access it and they won't need to have, you know, intricate knowledge of the actual structure of the responses that we're getting back. So let's open up our user info service. And what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that the load data method of the user info service is what actually takes care of transforming the data, right? So what that means is that any component from then on would be able to just call load data and have it in a pretty simplified format as opposed to having to, you know, do this deconstruction that we've seen here. So before we do that, though, let me show you how to transform data in an observable, right? Because our user info display component is subscribing to this load data method, right? So there's not really a good way that we know of yet to transform this data before it gets to this subscribe callback. Well, let me show you how that's done. Okay, we haven't seen this yet, but I'll just show you. What we're gonna do is we're gonna import something called map from rxjs slash operators. Okay, now what map does is it allows us to transform data flowing through an observable, right? So with this observable here, for example, the data is flowing through, and right now it's just flowing directly into this subscribe thing, and we're getting the raw data that we got back from the API right here. But what we can actually do is we can put together this sort of transformational pipeline for ourselves. And what that'll look like is this. We actually say this.http.get, and then after these parentheses here, we say dot pipe. And for the argument that we pass to pipe, we're going to pass this map thing that we imported. And what we do here inside map is we pass a callback that specifies how to transform the data that's flowing through that pipeline. All right, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to take the logic that we had in here. So we're going to say data.results, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we'll say data. And what we can do now is we can say return data.results0. And then back in our user info display component, we can just say user info, and then we can just directly say this.info equals user info. So what we've done here is we've removed that logic. Our user info display component no longer has the responsibility of knowing how the response data that we're getting back from the API is structured, okay? And we can actually take this a step further. Remember that I pointed out that we still have a pretty intricate knowledge in our component of how that user data is structured, but we can actually take this a step further. And in our user info service here, we can restructure our data into a format that suits our component better. All right, so the way we can do that, we can either add the extra logic directly to this map, or we can add another map. All right, so we can say map, user info raw, we'll call it, because this is before we've processed it. Oops, and we've got to put a comma there. And what we'll do is we'll say name, and this is where we'll put together the first name and last name from our raw user info. So we'll say user info raw dot name dot first plus space plus user info raw dot name dot last. Okay, so what that'll do is it'll make it so that in our user info display component, it'll just receive a user info object with that name property, which contains the full name, which means that we won't have to do this thing here, right? We'll be able to just change this to info.name, okay? And also just for the sake of example, if we wanted to rename other properties like email here, we could do that in our service as well. Like if we wanted to rename it to email address, for example, we could say user info raw dot email. Okay, and then we could go into our HTML file, change that to email address. And if we go back here, we'll see that that works perfectly. 
And again, the purpose of this is that our user info display component no longer has the responsibility of knowing how the API data is structured, right? That's all taken care of for us by our load data method in our user info service. Okay, so the last best practice we're gonna talk about with Angular actually involves avoiding doing something. And that something is duplicating the state, right? So here we're gonna talk about state duplication and what it is and basically how to avoid it. Okay, so state duplication basically happens when the same state, right, or the same data is represented in two different places in our application at the same time. Okay, so as an example of this, let's open up our counter button and our counter button page components. All right, so let's open those both up here. All right, now remember that when we built these two components, we made sure that the count was only contained inside the counter button page and not in the counter button component itself, right? Well, what I've seen in the past is that two components with this kind of relationship can actually have duplicate versions of the state. All right, so we've done the right thing here in just having our counter button page keep track of the count and then pass that down to our counter button component as an input. But again, what I've seen pretty frequently is that developers won't even have this as an input, All right? So let's go here and just remove that input for this example, All right? And they'll just have the counter button page and the counter button component both keep track of their own state, All right? So in other words, we'll emit this button clicked thing from our counter button component, which will tell our counter button page to increment the count, but then we'll also increment our count state like this. Oops, and we removed the count from the wrong place there. We need to remove it from our counter button. There we go. All right, and let's go to our counter button page. Okay, and the problem with this pattern, or this anti-pattern, I guess I should call it, is that it works most of the time, right? Oh, and that's right, we had it navigate to the event handling page after we reached a certain number of clicks. But the problem with this, right, is that it looks like it's just one state, but it's actually two different ones. Let's say we added a reset count button. All right, let's do that inside our counter button page component. We'll just have a button here that calls a reset count method that we'll define. So we'll say reset count. And then inside our TypeScript file, we'll define reset count void. And we'll just say this dot count equals zero, right? Okay, and now the problem here is that if we click the button and click reset count, well, now we've actually reset the count in the counter button page to zero, right? But the count now in the counter button component, which is displaying this message, is different, right? It's still three. So what that means is that our counter button page as a whole will no longer obey that threshold thing that we put in place where it, you know, shows the congratulations message or navigates to a different page or whatever like it used to because now the two states are out of sync, right? And in this situation, it's pretty obvious what happened because it's still a simple application. But this kind of thing can happen in a much more insidious way once our applications get more complex, right? Especially when we're doing things like loading data, doing animations, that kind of stuff is when having duplicate states can really be harmful. So anyway, that's something to avoid. You just wanna make sure in your Angular applications that state is only contained in a single spot and that if other components need that state in some way, we simply pass that down to them through inputs. All right, so let's just go and change this back. I'm just gonna hold down Control Z till we get back to the originals. There we go. And there we go. Welcome to lesson six, learn advanced Angular topics. In this lesson, you learn about a few topics that go beyond basic usage in Angular. That is, 
They're useful, but usually not suited for absolute beginners. By the end of the lesson, however, you'll have a good knowledge of how each of these concepts works, as well as how it fits in with the rest of the concepts we've learned in the course. We start off by learning about something called view encapsulation in Angular. This is followed by a discussion of how to save time by adding pre-made styling libraries such as Material UI, as well as we're going to look at how to use Angular's ng content directive. Well, that's our plan, so let's get started. Okay, the first advanced topic we're going to talk about in Angular is something called view encapsulation. Now, I mentioned earlier in the course when we first looked at styling in Angular, how Angular components automatically scope their styles so that they only affect the components we assign them to, right? So for example, for our counter button page, if we were to put some styles in the CSS file here, they wouldn't affect the counter button or the congratulations message, which it contains because again, those CSS rules are scoped. And that's again, something called view encapsulation in Angular. So what I want to talk about here is that there are actually a few different options for view encapsulation. And in order to demonstrate this, we're just going to open up our counter button page and we're going to open up the TypeScript file and the CSS file here. Okay, so we can define what kind of encapsulation we want for our components up here in the component decorator at the top, right? Same place where we have the selector, template URL, style URLs, etc. And what that's going to look like is we can add an encapsulation property here that's going to contain one of three different values. Let's start off by looking at the default value here. The default value for encapsulation in components is view encapsulation dot emulated. Now, basically what that means is that Angular will encapsulate the styles for our components by using an emulation technique. And what I mean by that is let's say we set some styles in here, right? Let's say maybe button, we'll make all our buttons with 48 pixel font size, right? So just big text inside our buttons, but only for our counter button page component, okay? So if we take a look now, and let's just bring up our HTML here to see what this is gonna look like, we see that our counter button page has its own button element here, right? But it's also got the button inside the counter button components HTML, right? And we see that the style we just defined with the large text only applies to the one inside the counter button page component and not to the button inside just the regular counter button component, right? So that's emulated view encapsulation. And the reason it's emulated is because the way Angular makes this happen, if we look at the styling for our components here, let's just select this one. We see that Angular adds this little ng content blah, 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 blah thing to our elements. And that's how it knows which styles to apply to which elements on the page, right? If we look over here at these styles now, we'll see that this font size 48 pixels is only applied to buttons with this same ng content tag thing, right? So in other words, the button that we have up here, well, that's got a different value for that. So the styling that we applied inside our counter button page component won't actually affect this one. So that's the emulated option for encapsulation in Angular. So another option for that is something called shadow DOM encapsulation. And shadow DOM, the problem with this is that it's not currently supported by most browsers, right? So the idea here is that shadow DOM allows us to encapsulate our styles without the sort of emulation that we just saw, right? Without needing to add extra properties to our elements and create our styles that way, All right? So generally we won't use shadow DOM. It doesn't work again for most browsers. So the only other option then is none, right? If we set view encapsulation to none, what that's gonna do is the styles that we define in this component will not be encapsulated. In other words, they'll basically become global styles, which usually is not what we want, right? If we go back and take a look now, we'll see that not only is the button inside our counter button component, which is a child of our counter button page, uh, not only does that have large text now, but all the other buttons in our app have that large text as well. 
Okay, so we generally don't want to do that. But anyway, I wanted to show you how view encapsulation works and some of the different options that are available to us for that. Generally, as we've done so far in our app, we'll just leave view encapsulation unset, which will leave it at its default value of emulated. And let's go back and just take this large font size for our button out of our CSS. Okay, so the next advanced topic we're going to talk about is how to add Font Awesome and Material UI to an Angular project. And I don't consider this an advanced project because it's difficult, because it isn't, but it's something that, for some reason, I don't see a lot of people doing until they've been working with Angular for a while. So I thought I would show you how to do that right here, and hopefully that helps make your Angular development much easier. So first of all, let's talk about what these two things are. Font Awesome is basically a library of icons that you can add to your applications, you know, just to improve the user interface. And if you go to fontawesome.com here, you can see all of the different icons that they have. Uh, you can search for ones like if you're looking for a pointer icon, you can click it, you can see, you know, what it's called, etc. Now to actually get these icons working in an Angular project, there are a few things we have to do. So first we need to stop our project and add something to it. And what we're going to be adding is the Angular Font Awesome package from NPM. And you can find this, by the way, if you go to npmjs.com and just search for Angular Font Awesome. You should be able to find it. Okay, so the way we're going to add this to our project is by typing ng add and then the name of the package, which is at fort awesome slash angular dash font awesome at version. And we're going to have to figure out the right version here from the version of Angular we're using. Right? So we see here we have the compatibility table, and to see what version of Angular we're using, and therefore which version we should choose, we just have to open up our package.json file, take a look at Angular Core, and we'll see we're using version 11. So we're going to put in 0.8.x as the version number. Okay, And we'll hit Enter, and it should add and install all of the necessary code for us. Okay, and the next thing it's going to ask us is which sets of icons we want to add to our project. Okay, so we saw back in the Font Awesome website that there were several different versions of each of these icons, right? It's depending on whether they're filled or just an outline, etc. So we're going to select all of these, and in order to do that, you actually have to use the arrow keys and the space bar. And once you've selected all three of these here, just hit enter. And that will add those icons to our project for us to use. Okay. And if we open up our app.module.ts file now, we'll see that it imported the font awesome module into this file and added it automatically to our imports down here, which means that we're able to use it in our components. All right, so let's take a look at how to use it now. And let's run our app again, just so we can see the results as we do them. So why don't we open up our counter button again? That seems to be a favorite component for the examples here. And let's open up now the HTML file and the TypeScript files. And the way this is going to work for adding icons, let's say we want to add the icon inside this button here. All right, we'll add the pointer icon that I showed you. The way we need to do that is we need to say FA icon. Right, this component here is made available to us by that module that I just showed you that Angular added to our app.module.ts file. And in order to specify which icon we actually want to display, we're going to need to set that as an input here. So we're going to need to say icon equals, and then we'll say like pointer icon or something like that. And then what we need to do is go into our TypeScript file and import the icon we want to use. Okay, so we're going to say, and we'll import the FA hand pointer that I showed you before from at Fort Awesome. And then we'll choose uh, free solid SVG icons like that. And then inside here under our input, we just need to put pointer icon equals fa hand 
pointer. Okay, and now if we go back, we should see that it added that little pointer icon to our button. All right, and that's pretty much all we need to do to add font awesome icons to our Angular project. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is Material UI and how to add that to an Angular project. So first of all, for those of you who don't know what Material UI is, Material UI is basically a user interface framework that makes it a lot easier to make good looking website. It's what Google uses for basically all of its different products and it makes it very easy to create nice, clean, usable interfaces very quickly. And it says React here, but you can definitely use Material UI with Angular as well. And that's what I'm gonna show you how to do here. So first of all, to get started with Material UI, we're gonna add it to our project just like we did with Font Awesome. So we're gonna say ng add, and we just need to say at Angular slash Material and hit enter. And then it's gonna ask us to choose a pre-built theme for our application. So we can choose any of these color schemes that they've chosen for us. Let's choose, I don't know, deep purple and amber sounds good. And then it's gonna ask us if we wanna set up global angular material typography styles. We'll say yes, that'll basically create some nice styles that will be applied to all of our components. As far as browser animations, we'll say yes as well. And once we've answered all those questions, it will basically go through and update some of the files in our project and install the Angular Material package. Okay, and now that we've done that, let's open up appmodule.ts. And we're going to see that it's added another module. It's added this browser animations module that we said we wanted during setup. All right, now in order to actually get Material UI components to work in our Angular application, we're gonna have to import individual modules for those components in this file here. So just to show you what that's gonna look like, let's run our application again. And if we go back here and take a look at our application, we'll see that the fonts have changed slightly. That's from Material UI as well that did that. And let's say that we want to change the buttons we're using to Material UI's buttons, which generally look a lot better than the ones we have here. So the way we're going to do that is inside our app module here, we're going to import the module for the button we want to use. So we'll say import, and we're going to import the matte raised button module from at angular slash material slash button, okay? Oops, and that should actually just be matte button module. And then we're gonna add matte button module to our imports here. And that will allow us to use all of Material UI's buttons that they provide. Okay, so what that's gonna look like, if we go back to our counter button component here in the HTML, is instead of just having a button here, we're going to say M-A-T, raised button and change the closing tag to that as well. And it looks like we have to actually restart our app to get that to work. And then in order to use that button component here, all we have to do is add this little thing to our button that says matte raised button and raised button is just one of the variations there's also just you know matte dash button matte flat button matte stroked button matte icon button etc but we're just going to do matte raised button and if we go back and take a look we see that that's now a nice material ui button instead of the default html button like we had it okay and another thing is that if we want to change the color of the button we can do that by selecting from one of several different options, right? So for example, we can set the warning color, which is by default set by Material UI's theme that we selected. So if we set it to color equals warn, then we'll see that that's now the warning color. If we wanna set it to the primary color, we'll see that it shows that color. If we wanna set it to an accent color, We'll see that it displays a different color, right? There's a lot of different 
colors that we can select from, all controlled by our theme. And that's kind of the nice part, is that we don't really have to think about those aspects of the design now. All right, so let's go through and just swap out the rest of our buttons. So we'll leave our counter button as an accent colored button. Go into our counter button page and make our button in here a raised button as well. And we'll just leave that as the default white color like that. And we'll make our success and danger buttons those kind of buttons as well. So let's go into here, into our button component, change this to raised button. All right, and we see that those are now that color. If we wanted to actually set them to the theme, success and danger colors, which the theme doesn't contain a success color, but it does contain a danger color, we could actually go into the danger button and success button components themselves. And that's basically how you add Material UI to an Angular application. Obviously, there's a lot of other things that you can do with it, right? You can basically create the entire styling of the application just using that. It's very quick and easy, right? You can do stuff like create a nav bar. So feel free to explore around with Material UI and see what you can come up with. All right, the last advanced concept that we're going to talk about in Angular is a very important one, and it's called the ng content directive. Okay, so in order to introduce what ng content is and how it's used, let's take a look at any of our components. All right, so let's take a look at our counter button pages HTML. All right, you may have noticed that whenever we display a component that we've created, right, such as our congratulations message component, our counter button component, etc. We use two tags, right? We use two HTML tags in here, but up until now, we've always left this empty, right? And you might be wondering, well, is there a way that we can actually put some kind of content in here and use that in some way? And the answer to that is yes, and that's exactly what ng content helps us do. So first of all, let's take a look at a situation where it would be really helpful to use ng content. Let's say that we want to create components for displaying things like tips or quotes or that kind of thing that you usually see in books, right? So basically it'll have a little square on the screen, right? It'll have a heading that will say like tip, right? Maybe with a little exclamation point. And then inside that, it'll have the actual content of the tip. Now, if that doesn't make sense yet, don't worry. You'll see exactly what it'll look like in just a minute. So let's start off by creating a new component. We'll call it tip section, all right? We'll say something like that. And let's open up our components HTML and TypeScript here and take a look at it. Now, one way of implementing our component, which will look something like this, it'll have a div, it'll have some kind of heading at the top that says tip, right? Maybe it'll even have a font awesome icon. We'll say FA icon, and we'll use like an exclamation point icon or something like that. So we'll say icon equals exclamation point icon. Okay, and inside our component here, we're gonna say import fa exclamation circle from Fort Awesome, and we'll just choose the free solid SVG icons again. And then in here, we're gonna say exclamation point icon equals fa exclamation circle. All right, so that should display that right here. We'll probably even want to have that inside the heading here, so we'll do that. All right, and then underneath that, we're going to have the content. Now, without ng content, the way that we would normally display the content would probably be something like this. We would just have our content as an input, and we would allow the user to pass in whatever text they want to display inside that tip. All right, so let's add an input here. We'll say input, then we'll say input content, just like that. And now if we wanna display that, so let's say on our counter button page, we might wanna display it. Right here above our counter button, we'll say app. And for the content, we'll have to say something like click the button 
more than five times, something like that. And that's it. All right, so we need to start our app again. And now if we go back and take a look here, we're gonna see that it's displaying this tip section here. And why don't we add just a border to that to make it look a little better. So let's open up our tip section CSS. We'll just say div and we'll say border. One pix dotted black. All right, so it'll just look like that, right? It's not the best looking thing in the world, if you want to spend a little more time working on the styling, go ahead. But anyway, that's what we want it to look like. And this works, but the problem is that it becomes kind of cumbersome to have to pass in our content this way. Especially because we might want to display several paragraphs, right? As well as other things like images, icons, buttons, things like that inside this tip component. So without ng content, which is where I'm going with all of this, without ng content, we would have to actually have a different version of this component for each different layout that we wanted, right? If we wanted one with an image, one with a button, etc. But with ng content, what we're able to do, right? We're going to remove this content here. Just going to cut that, remove the content input. And what we're able to do is we're actually able to put things inside of our components like that. And now we can add several different things in there, right? So we can say, click the button more than five times. And then it will navigate you. All right, and currently this isn't gonna work, right? We're gonna see that there's nothing displayed here so far. And that's where the ng content directive comes in. Because in our tip component, what we can do now is instead of displaying the content like this, we can put in a special tag, which is ng-content. And what this will do is just like our router outlet did in our app components HTML file, right? This ng content will sort of be replaced by whatever content we actually put inside the tags of this component when we display it inside of another component, right? So in other words, all of this. So if we go back now and take a look, we'll see that that content is now inside of there. And we can do other things as well, like add buttons, right? So inside here, we could do something like add a button. We'll make it a raised button. And we'll just make it say, I understand. And that goes right inside the tip box as well, right? So using the ng content directive, like we just saw, you can make your components much more flexible because now we can basically configure stuff inside of them as well as outside of them. Welcome to lesson eight, host Angular applications. In this lesson, we see how to take the web applications that we've built using Angular and host them so that they can be accessed by people anywhere in the world. By the end of the lesson, you'll have your own Angular web application hosted on several different platforms. So the main focus of the next few videos will be to show you two of my favorite options for quickly and easily hosting the Angular applications you create. And these are gonna be Netlify and Firebase hosting. Now, this is often an overlooked topic in programming, but making sure that others can access and benefit from your work is an incredibly important part of learning any new library. So let's get started. Okay, so the first method that we're gonna to see to deploy our Angular applications is using a site called Netlify. And as it happens, this is also one of the easiest ways that I've found to deploy. And for the vast majority of hobby projects that you'll wanna work on, it is also free. So here's how we're gonna deploy our app to Netlify. We're gonna start off by installing the Netlify CLI package, which is basically just a collection of tools that will allow us to deploy our app to Netlify. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna say npm install dash dash save dev Netlify dash CLI and hit enter.
And once we've installed the Netlify CLI package, the next thing we're gonna do is actually build our app. So when we're deploying Angular apps, this is gonna need to be a key step in our deployment process is actually building. And basically what happens during the build, which by the way, you can do by running the command ng build, and we'll just let that run. But what this build process does is it takes all of our TypeScript files and all of our code that we've written here, and it bundles it up and builds it into code that can be run by a browser. And we're gonna see that once that command completes, we now have this dist directory in our project, which contains all of the sort of built code for our project, right? So if you take a look at something like main.js, this is the code that the user's browser is actually going to run, is in here, along with, you know, runtime.js, vendor.js, all that other stuff. So now that we have our project built, the way that we're gonna deploy it is by running the command npx netlify deploy, and this is gonna deploy our project to Netlify. So it'll ask us a few questions here, right? The first thing we're gonna select is create and configure a new site. And you might need to set this up if this is your first time using Netlify. I'm already logged in through the CLI, so it may ask you to log in using GitHub or something like that. I'm just gonna choose this here since that's linked to my GitHub account. After this, it's gonna ask us for a site name. We're just gonna leave that blank and enter it the way it is. Okay, and then it's gonna ask us for the directory that we wanna publish. And for this, we're going to put in dist slash my Angular app, since up here, that is the folder that we want to actually publish to Netlify. All right, so we're gonna hit enter here. And then it's gonna upload all of the files to Netlify, and we should be good to go. So you're gonna see this URL here, which we can copy and paste into a browser. And we should see our app show up in the browser. And the important part to note about this is that this is now public, right? You can send this link to one of your family members, to a friend, something like that, and they'll actually be able to access it, which is pretty cool, right? Although you might wanna make this app look a little better before you do so. So that's how you host with Netlify, right? It's pretty easy, takes about two minutes to do. Uh, this is one of my favorite ways of hosting Angular apps. Okay, the final way that we're gonna see to host our Angular apps is using something called Firebase. Firebase is a platform that's provided by Google. It's sort of a layer on top of Google Cloud Platform that makes it very easy to host our apps. And the good news is that this is also free for hosting smaller, you know, hobby scale websites like ours. So before you get started here, you're gonna need to create a Firebase account. I've already got one here and I'm already logged in, so I won't go through that. It's pretty straightforward to do. And once you've done that, we're gonna go back to our Angular project. And there's a few commands that we have to run in order to publish our app to Firebase. The first thing we have to do is just like we installed the Netlify CLI earlier, we have to install the Firebase CLI, which just contains some tools that we can use to publish our apps to Firebase through the command line. So the first command we're gonna run, which will install those CLI tools for us, is curl dash lowercase s capital L, and then HTTPS colon slash slash firebase dot tools and then pipe bash and we're going to hit enter and we may need to enter our password here and that will install the firebase cli tools for us okay so in my case i already have the firebase tools installed which is why i see that but you'll probably see some other output so once we've installed the firebase cli the next thing we're going to do is log into firebase through the console and the way we do that is by typing Firebase login. And that might ask you if you want to allow Firebase to collect CLI usage and error information. I'm just gonna say no there. And what that's gonna do is in a browser window, it's gonna ask you to log in to Firebase. Okay, so you'll just need to select your account, stuff like that. For me, it's actually on another monitor. So I'm gonna just log in there. And once we've done that, you should see success logged in and then you should see your email there that you logged in with. Okay, so now that we're logged into the CLI, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna type Firebase init. And what that's gonna do is initialize Firebase inside our directory here. And what that's gonna do is allow us to create a new project in Firebase that we're gonna publish our Angular app to. So the first question it's gonna ask us is which Firebase features we want. So Firebase has many other features that we can use. 
it's got database stuff. It's got stuff for database, for serverless, for, you know, storage. But the only thing we want here is hosting. So you're gonna navigate down to there using the arrow keys and hit the space bar and then hit enter. It took me a little while to figure out how to use that myself. And after that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new project. Okay, this is the new project that we're gonna publish our Firebase app to. Next, it's gonna ask you to enter a unique project ID, and this has to be unique across all Firebase, so you may need to try a few times in order to get a Firebase ID that no one's used. What I'm gonna do is use my Angular app, and then my name here, and hit enter. And then it's gonna ask what you wanna call your project. If you want, you can provide sort of an internal name for your project that only you're gonna see. I'm just gonna leave it as the default, which is the project ID, and hit enter. And then it's gonna spin for a little while while it creates our project. Okay, the next thing it's gonna ask us, uh, Netlify asked us pretty much the same thing. It's gonna ask us what we wanna use as our public directory, right? That is, this is gonna be the directory that has all of our files in it. And for this, just like with Netlify, we're gonna say dist slash my angular app and hit enter. Next thing it's gonna ask us if we wanna configure it as a single page app. And for that, we're gonna say yes as well. And then it's gonna ask if we wanna overwrite the existing index.html file. For that, we're gonna say no, because we wanna keep it the way it is. And then after that, we're gonna see Firebase initialization complete. So we've created our project in Firebase for our Angular app. And the last thing we have to do now is say Firebase deploy and hit enter. And that will deploy our app to Firebase. And just one note here is that you rephrase. And just one note here is that when you make changes to your project, you're going to need to run ng build again. Right? That's the command that we saw earlier when we were looking at Netlify that actually built our app and created this dist directory. Okay, and it'll show us rephrase. Okay, and once it's deployed our app, it's going to show us this URL and we're going to open that up in a browser. And just like with Netlify, we should see that we're able to see our app, right? So we're able to go to the counter button page, the event handling page, the multiple choice page, etc., and see our app there. And again, you can copy and paste these URLs, send them to whoever you want, and they'll be able to access it too, since this is now part of the World Wide Web. So that's how you host using Firebase. Again, it's relatively easy to do, slightly more involved than with Netlify, but it's still a very short process. Well, we've really covered a lot of ground in this course. Hopefully now that it's coming to an end, you've gone from knowing relatively little about Angular to being fairly proficient at some of the more advanced parts of it. So just to briefly recap all the topics we've covered here, the first lesson in this course we provided an overview of Angular as a library within the wider context of front-end development. We covered topics such as what Angular is and what it's good at, and we also created and ran our first program while learning many of the basics of its syntax. In the second lesson, we moved on to learning about the component lifecycle in Angular, how to use state in our components, as well as how to handle other events that occur in our web applications. And we moved on to the third lesson then, where we learned about routing in Angular and some related concepts such as URL and query parameters. And we then moved on to see how to create several commonly used front-end components such as forms and nav bars, as well as how to make network requests from Angular components. After that, we moved on to see how to write so-called clean code in Angular, right? We took a look at a few very important patterns and anti-patterns and saw how to apply them in our Angular code. And after that, of course, we moved on to a few advanced concepts in Angular, such as view encapsulation, adding pre-made style libraries, and using the ng content directive. And of course, last but not least, we saw how to actually build and host the Angular applications we created, which, as I said, is a very often overlooked concept in Angular. Well, thanks again for joining me in this live lessons, and I hope you enjoyed learning Angular with me.